The date is February 21st, 2018. The location is at the home of John Cherhowitz in Mount Prospect, Illinois. The time is 10 a.m. Today, the person being interviewed is John Cherhowitz. John was born April 2nd, 1925. He served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. The interview Navy Air Corps. Navy Air Corps. <laughs> well, I just... Uh, the interview is being conducted by Jeff Hoffman. The interview is being conducted on behalf of the Oral History Program at the Yankee Air Museum in Bellevue, Michigan. Good morning, John. Morning, Jeff. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the Oral History Program at the Yankee Air Museum for letting me come in and conduct this interview in your home. Oh, so, my pleasure. So let's begin with when and where you were born. Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I was born a long time ago. Uh, I was born in Chicago uh, at, uh, what hospital was that? Lars, do you remember what hospital? Yes. No, that's right, you were too young. <laughs> um, well, Chicago's good enough for now. I don't, it was in Chicago. I don't remember. Maybe the hospital isn't even there yet. Oh, okay. That was 92 <clears throat> years ago. Can you give me a little background on where you grew up, though, after you were born? Well... I was born here in 1925. Yes. Uh, we got that. And uh, that was at the beginning of the Depression. And uh, my father uh, was doing odd jobs. Uh, and work was very difficult to get, find. But uh, my grandfather on my father's side was pretty well to do in Poland. He had a farm, a big farm. Uh, as a matter of fact, the farm was uh, handed down to him, uh, I don't know how many generations. And I have the papers proving it because my great 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 grandfather, I don't know how many times back, was a uh, captain of the guards for a queen, a Polish queen. See, at that time in Poland, they had a lot of kings and queens. Like we have uh, uh, municipalities or something here. With the, they had a lot of little sections. Each one had his castle and had his guards and so forth. And uh, if anyone had any problem with someone, uh, they all... Uh, joined together and helped lick it. So anyway, uh, decided to send my mother and my brothers and I to Poland. And uh, what year was that? Uh, Nineteen thirty or so, something like that. It was, it was three years earlier than thirty-three, so. Uh, that would be about the uh, beginning of 1930. There, uh, no, that would make me five, six. Uh, it would be about 31, 1931. Could you speak the Polish language? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, my, par my parent uh, at the time in uh, uh, Poland, uh, which was my mother, she tried to teach me, but she didn't go to school herself. <laughs> so uh, uh, it was pretty difficult. And uh, there was no schools within uh, easy reach to send me to. So there. how far from, like, Warsaw were you? Were you way out in the country? or? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it was pretty uh, desolate. Uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the kitchen, which was the main room yeah. in the thing, it was all dirt floor. Yeah. Uh, but the dirt was compacted, it was like cement. Oh. They actually took a uh, <coughs> homemade broom and swept it out. Yeah. Uh, so it was like uh, soft cement. So uh, did you go to uh, grade school in Poland? No. Well, you didn't? No, no. It was home school. It was too, it was too far. The school was in town, the, the town of Vestinitz, 
which was a, uh, it was a, close enough to go to church, but uh, <laughs> but not every day to go to school. No, yeah. not to go to school. Okay. Um, and uh, in in winter time, it was closer because uh, the lake that uh, was there uh, would freeze, and you would go straight across a section, a corner of the lake. Um, Let's see, what else can I tell you about it? Uh, the, the town, uh, well, actually, it was within walking distance, but over there at that time, distance didn't seem much to walk, even if you had to walk two hours one direction. That was walkable. Yeah. Uh, and I remember we would go barefoot, and we had the shoes, and when we got to the gates of the church, we stopped to put our shoes on. <laughs> um, then when I came to this country... Uh, you came father, back to Chicago? Uh, yeah. My father had a difficult time buying shoes oh. for, because nothing fitted. Oh. Uh, Buster Brown had uh, one of those machines <clears throat> Where you put your feet and then you could see the bones in your feet and stuff. And uh, they all said, see, you can't fit a shoe to those feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they threw those machines out. I understand they're bad for your feet. Oh, okay. So uh, <clears throat> you, were, you were back in Chicago in like 1934, something like that? Uh, yeah, uh, it was, uh, in the 30s. see what happened, <coughs> what happened was that was just about the time when Hitler was starting to yeah. show his The Nazi speech. party, Hitler, yeah. 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 And, um. So it's kind of good to get, certainly get out of Poland before 39. <laughs> my, my father, uh, over here, uh, he, he got a job, uh, janitoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, the people knew more what was going on in Europe than we did there. To me, I was uh, too young to understand. Yeah, you're less than 10 years old. Yeah. But I recognized the older people didn't know. And my father said, well, we found out uh, because the end of my grandfather's farm was the German border. Oh, really? Prussian, yeah. And had the German sentries on there. Yeah. And so we used to go back and forth to shop. You needed nails or naphtha or benzene or uh, anything like that that we didn't have in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, we could get it there. But when they closed the borders, there was no more... Crossing. No more trade. Yeah. No more crossing over. Yeah. Us kids, we would be playing the way around one side of the border one minute, next side of the border next minute, yeah. and I would run off and get some little things, and the guys didn't bother, didn't, didn't pay attention. Yeah. Uh, so coming back to Chicago, uh, being in Poland and speaking Polish, was it difficult to get back into uh, English-speaking Schools? <laughs> well, see, when I came back, I spoke German, oh. Polish, and Lithuanian, because oh. Lithuania was on that corner, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the border between Lithuania and Poland changed depending on the <laughs> time of day. <laughs> wow. Not quite that bad, no, but... Uh, it will change uh, every couple of years. Yeah. Uh, but the people all spoke all the different languages, and uh, the kids spoke the same. We, we played with the German kids. We played with the Lithuanian kids. They played with the, the German and Lithuanian kids, and so everybody. Very natural. Yeah, we. Uh, 
spoke th three languages. Uh -huh. So when I came back to uh, uh, Chicago, uh, in school, the first school I went to was uh, Bateman, uh, which was a great school. Oh, okay. And of course I had to start at the lowest class, 1B. One, one uh -huh. And uh, So that was a little behind versus, versus your age? Oh yes, okay. because uh, uh, I was I was ten years old. Oh, okay. Instead of six. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, I was uh, <coughs> quite a bit bigger than anyone in the class. Uh, but they put me in the back seat in the last row. Oh. And as I learned a few words in that, I guess forward. Oh, that was that was good progress. Yeah. Uh, and they did use me because uh, there was a lot of Polish people and other kind of kids that uh, would come in and didn't know anything other than the language from where they came. Their native language, yeah. And so they used me as a... a translator. <laughs> translator, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully uh, you get good grades on that. <laughs> So uh, where did where did you go to high school then after his grammar school? Where did you go to high school? Well, that yeah, was another thing. Uh, well, from from uh, Bateman, that wasn't my last school. Uh, I uh, went every summer to summer school, and then I skipped a couple of grades, and then. Uh, um, let's see. Yeah, went to went to Schubert School. From there, went to Schubert School, which was on uh, Long and uh, Long, just a little bit uh, south of Diversity. Oh, near Lincoln Park. Uh, pardon? Near Lincoln Park. Well, yeah, but Lincoln Park was way east. This was about. 50, oh, this is the west side. Okay. Fifty-three hundred west. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, actually, I graduated from uh, Schubert School, mm -hmm. and I graduated at fourteen, I believe. Oh, that's good. So you're sort of so caught I, up then. So I did all those through skipping and jumping yeah. and yeah. what have you. <clears throat> so uh, then, did you go to a high school after that? Yes. Uh, the school I was supposed to go to was the Foreman High School, which was in our area. Yeah. But there was a school at that time called Lane Technical High, and my father thought that was where I should go. Was that boys and girls or all boys? No, no, that was an all boys school. All boys, okay. Yes. <laughs> and it was the largest school in the country at the time, I believe. Wow. So it must have uh, been pretty famous then. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Lane Technical High. <clears throat> And uh, I think that's one of the reasons I got where I got in the service because uh, uh, I took uh, classes there, uh, electrical. Uh, I had uh, foundry. Uh, wow. I had uh, machines. Uh, you, you get uh, learn a trade in school that way. Oh yes. Yeah. So it was somewhat vocational as well as a high school. Yes. As a matter of fact, there was a, a course that. Uh, you took a vocational or you took a college course. Oh, which, college uh, prep then. Oh. Yeah, so in college it, <clears throat> it uh, uh, added, well, I don't know what they added, whether it was history, I, I think everyone had to learn history and uh, English. Yeah, English was rough. I, I was good at it up to a certain point and then I, after that point I it was difficult uh, for me. Oh, with with knowledge of all those other languages, English was sort of a barrier then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But I, I soon uh, forgot a lot of the other languages, except Polish, because uh, we spoke Polish in the house until yeah. my father uh, said, all right, that, that's enough Polish in the house. Oh, he put the... <laughs> yeah. And so we spoke English in... Uh, it was hardest for my mother. <laughs> um, so did you get the kind of technical training that would be related to aviation? Or 
sort of quasi aviation? Was it really? The only way that I would say that was the, uh, <coughs> the ability to do things with your hands. Okay. Uh, which, which was uh, preparatory to uh, almost any field. Yeah. Uh, you could apply it. Yeah. Uh, Did you learn how to use a slide rule? Oh, I was good at that. Were you? Oh, yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, where the heck was it? I was teaching slide rule for a while. <laughs> I the student forgot. becomes the teacher. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I forgot where, but I was, uh, I liked that. I had a beautiful slide rule too. Uh, it was a uh, Japanese, oh. and uh, it was made of bamboo, wow. little bamboo strips. So you figure while you were learning in yeah. Lane Technical School, the Japanese kids were using the same tools <laughs> to learn in Japan. Huh? <laughs> uh, How about sports? Did you get reactive in sports? Uh, not really. Uh, I didn't have the time. Oh. Uh, see, my father, in order to make a place, a good place for us to live, and uh, we always had a car every couple of years, a car. <coughs> he had a large job, and uh, I, I had a, I, I learned early in life to, uh, uh, how to clean halls. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, I didn't have to vacuum mm -hmm. because uh, I was <clears throat> too little for vacuum cleaners in those days. They were heavy monsters. Yeah. Not the little uh, portable units like today. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I uh, was real good at polishing brass. Oh. In those days, all the buildings had a lot of brass work on the doors. Brass fixtures and, and everything. And decoration. The night lights, uh, or they oh. had, oh, those things sh shine like gold. Um, I soon learned how to make them shine with muriatic acid. Oh, that'll do it. <laughs> I would wipe them down and everything, I think it's shine like gold. So you were doing so well in school, did you receive any honors? Yes, uh, I, I, yeah, I got a, on my cap, right there, my, uh, it's oh. back there on the table. Yeah. Uh, I've got the Four Years uh, Honor Society. National Honor Society National. from the high school? Oh, yes. okay. Okay. So what year did, did you graduate? Do you remember? Well, uh, it took me right to service, so I, uh, I graduated in uh, 43. Okay. 43. Yeah. Yeah, because I enlisted uh, before that, before oh. I finished school, and when they found out I was 17, they, they kicked me out uh, there. And, did you, uh, did you say you were 18 and then they found out you were 17? Did you actually yeah. claim to be 18? Yeah. Oh, that, so that's the story, right? <laughs> um, so what? So uh, uh, I went back to school, back to Lane, <clears throat> and, uh, and then when I graduated, at 18, uh, they took me right away. As a matter of oh. fact, I got the uh, a summons, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Well, before the, that, uh, did you have any employment during the time you were in high school? Did you did you work jobs in addition to going to classes? Uh, yes. Uh, the summer, the summer, I. Uh, uh, got a job at Union Special Sewing Machine Company. Oh. Uh, it was located on the north side of the river, directly across from the Merchandise Mart building. Oh. The Merchandise Mart was huge. Yeah. And especially in those days, it was big. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and it was so I, I worked uh, 11 hours a night. Oh, uh, so it was. Like you went to school, then you worked like an evening shift, uh, or well, even longer. Th than that. This was uh, uh, one summer. Oh, a summer. Okay. Uh, one summer, I worked there uh, in the machine shop. They taught me how to <coughs> drill holes and measure them and uh, whatever else, and uh, never knew what the heck I was making uh, until uh, one day. They while in the service, uh, I was sitting in the plane, and they had a, a small library in there, and I looked in the manual, looking through, 
had the names of all the different factories that contributed to that plane. And I saw a Union Special Sewing Machine. Ah, so they, I, they made the connection even though you had long gone. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I looked it up in there and what I was making was a little metal uh, base that was used in the Norton uh, the bomb site. The bomb site. I'll be darned. Yeah. At least you can make the connection after those years. I mean, really kind of uh, en enriched your experience <laughs> from beginning uh, to end. It, it was funny too because working at night, oh, it was like, oh, it was loud. You, you, you didn't go to sleep. But uh, <laughs> when going home, I uh, would get the uh, streetcar to Central, the west of Central Avenue, and then I would always catch the same bus, same driver, mm -hmm. and I'd lay across the seat uh, and sleep, and the bus driver would wake me up when we got to my street, and then I'd go home. Oh boy, you really depended on him. Yeah. So in addition to uh, the sewing machine company, did you work elsewhere or go to junior college, things like that, before the service? Well, when I uh, graduated, uh, there was a few months, I believe, before I uh, was called into the service. And so I did go to Wright Junior College. Oh. Uh, but uh, I was no sooner there for a couple of months, uh, it was just before I went in. And uh, the government came and uh, took the school over. Oh, for their own training? Cl closed the doors <laughs> and uh, cleared everything out. Oh. And uh, that was the last I was in there until uh, I was uh, sent there uh, after I uh, uh, served my uh, uh, in the Navy. Uh, I went in the, uh, after Farragut, Idaho. I, I was sent to Farragut, Idaho. Okay, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, and they sent me there, and I ended up back in Wright Junior College, so only just oh, in uniform. Uh, another <laughs> circle, okay. So let's, let's establish this. So you tried to enlist when you were 17, claiming to be 18, and they found out. Yeah. So were, were you drafted? Did you actually get a letter from the president? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you I, did get I, your letter I, from the president. I was uh, <laughs> summoned. I was summoned. I think it says summons. Yeah. So how did you how did you wind up picking the the Navy Air Corps out of all the I choices? didn't uh, oh, oh. they 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 sent me uh, and uh, I didn't know I was going into the uh, Air Corps I was just uh, being sent to school Well you initially went to like a boot camp right uh, Yeah that that was in the one the uh, Alpine Navy and <laughs> Yeah the call Farragut, I know. Yeah so that's really where you entered the service? Eight, you went to Farragut, Idaho? Yeah, eight to 10,000 altitude <coughs> yeah. uh, for the Navy. They, uh. they used to call us the Swiss Navy. Uh, <laughs> so that was your boot camp? That was my boot camp. So you had rifle training and things like that? Oh, it, it was a rough training. Was it? Oh. Oh, geez. Uh, was it run by the, it was run by the Navy, you had naval instructors? And, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, in those days, I don't know why, but everything was commando course, commando run, commando this or that. Oh, okay. And uh, they didn't care. It was broken <coughs> legs, broken arms. Uh, um, it, didn't, it didn't matter. As long as they like, heal. Like, like one of the things that, uh, up in the mountains, there was a gorge, real deep gorge. And you, you'd look down over the side, and they had a thing built over it with ropes and you had to grab it and swing across it <laughs> and you didn't know if you were going to get to the other side or not. Well being in Idaho there was really a, a deep ravine there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so there was a lot of that. And then, um, you, and then what, what training followed boot camp? Did you go to uh, 
Uh, no, no, College no, Station? It, pardon? Did you go to College Station, Texas for that training? or? No, College Station, uh, that was uh, later on. Uh, okay. At first, after boot camp, I went to uh, what they called pre radio. Oh, pre radio. Which okay. was uh, Wright Junior College. Oh, like you said, yes. And, when and, I went and the there, Navy had taken over. Yes. Okay. And when I went there, we slept in what used to be the library up on the third floor. Uh -huh. had the triple decker bunks. Whew. Uh, yeah. Well, they were kind of like shipboard bunks. <laughs> uh, and then the hallway outside of the library, uh, they had uh, chiseled all that out of the cement and put in toilets, a whole string of toilets. Oh God, there must have been, there must have been uh, at least 15 facing one way and then there was another 15 toilets back to back on that. So you know, there was about 30 toilets on there and uh, then on the other opposite walls there were sinks. Sinks put mirrors in so you could go there and wash your face and shave and whatever else. So were they, were yeah. they running this at capacity? It sounds like they were really ramping up to have quite a few people go through there. Oh yes, uh, because that's not all they taught. They, they were teaching some other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on their, they were using the whole, the entire school. It worked out good because it had the lunch room and kitchen and everything, all the facilities. All self-contained. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, that school always brings to mind uh, one of the fellows that I made friends with um, in class. And uh, one thing, you listened in class. You, there was no burst out or, or making fun of anything. You'd be right out. Wow. <laughs> Just like that. Uh, because we were told that only about 10% were going to make it to, to the end. 90% washout, huh? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, but this guy, he worked for Disney, Walt Disney, and in those days when they were making films and movies, they had to make the characters and they made a whole bunch of them and each one just slightly different. Yeah. See? And that was one of the things he was doing. Oh, the early uh, days of animation. Yeah. Yeah. And he was real good. He, he could he could look at you, and he could draw you oh. only as a character. <laughs> yeah. But you'd recognize immediately that that was you. Oh, put your head on the mouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <coughs> uh, so what did what did this school prepare you for? Did you go to a, a, a real radio school then after that? Uh, actually, they were. I'd, I'd say they wanted to see how much math we knew. Okay. And uh, some basic electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then real, real basic, uh, which way current flows and <coughs> things like that. And uh, then from there, from there I was sent to, uh, oh, by the way, uh, it was convenient for me because my folks lived close to that school because I uh, was You're in town. Here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then in fact, only about four or five blocks from the school. And weekends, I'd run home. Oh, so I see uh, where you spent your leave. <laughs> your liberty. But, uh, I couldn't uh, during the week, and that because they took muster every evening. You had yeah, you had to be present. Yeah, You had to be there. And you didn't dare step off the uh, street, off the curb. Yeah. Uh, had guards <clears> on <throat> all the corners. Wow. And we were allowed to go outside and smoke. Yeah. If you smoked. I, I never did smoke. And uh, uh, the girls would come over there. They, they would wait for when they would let us out and meet all the girls. 
and I'd meet girls that I knew before I went into the service. So from there, from there, then uh, I went to Texas A and M, which was College Station. Yeah. And uh, so, what was that? Technical or radio or what? What program was that? Well, you know, it's a funny thing because it, it was very highly technical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was one of the first things that they uh, had there. Was a uh, an oscilloscope. And this oscilloscope had a large tube <coughs> and a faceplate, and you'd have to put the faceplate onto the, as the tube, only a single gun, and uh, to pump the air pressure out of it. Hmm. So if you're going to be using that oscilloscope, uh, you had to prepare for it quite a while ahead to get the oscilloscope ready mm -hmm. uh, on that. Uh, there was only some laboratories along the East Coast that had those things. Raytheon. And Western. they had yeah. some uh, <coughs> uh, instructors, professors uh, that would teach us. And uh, we were getting into some pretty high voltage work in there. Um, that's on the technical side. But then they had you know, archery, <laughs> dancing, uh, golf, archery, uh, tennis. And so I guess they thought that we would be officers at one time. Okay. This is like cultural enrichment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they wanted us, if we were going to be an officer, to look like one. Yeah. Uh, and act like one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we ate uh, in their uh, cafeteria, but we had family style. We had these Texas Aggies were uh, serving us. Oh, the students? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and I was there one winter. Well, I was there the winter. The, and I know that because the winter of that's 43. where Bing Crosby came to visit us and sang White Christmas. Perfect. Yeah. And of course, Bing Crosby Who's he? Who's been Crosby oh. uh, at that time? Yeah, uh, 1943. Who, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. Um, something else that I remember uh, in College Station, I was walking through, and this, that time of year where I came from was winter, and uh, I went into a barber shop, and there was a man sitting that was getting a haircut. And we were talking about the weather, and he said, yeah, I wish it would snow once. I, I, not so much for me, because I saw snow, but my grandson, you know, he's never seen snow. <laughs> and he was hoping it would snow. Yeah. So evidently, snow was a curiosity down there. I'll bet, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh... This was still technical training, not really any exposure to aviation yet, right? No, okay. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea that I was going into the air force. So what what happened after this training was complete? What, what did that prepare you for? Uh, well, th that's where they dropped oh. uh, a number of men. Um, we had a test every week. Wow. A test every week, and we were three to a room. And the lights were out at, I believe, 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock. No, I think it was 9 o'clock now. No, go on, I should have taken more of those B B12 pills <laughs> for my memory. You're, you're doing really good. Um, <clears throat> we uh, so you had to have lights out and the guards on the outside. Oh, and they would blow taps mm -hmm. outside. It was beautiful. Oh. It, it, it was beautiful, the sound. 
there. But anyhow, what we would do is we would have new batteries for our flashlight, and the three of us would get under a blanket in the lower bunk and put it over our head, and we'd have the book in there, and we'd be testing each other. <laughs> oh, preparing for the next day or so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Because uh, yeah. you said they had a test every week. Yes. Okay. Every Friday yeah. and Saturday, you knew whether you were shipping out or not. <laughs> uh, so what? What if someone did get shipped out? Where would they go? To the regular Navy or? Well, no. Uh, what they did is uh, they uh, needed uh, radio operators. Oh, okay. And so they made radio operators because we were learning. The code also. Yeah, they still had some skills. But we like, yeah we we had to, all we had to know was five words a minute, mm -hmm. but what they were doing was grooming, like uh, trying to clone, uh, be more accurate, uh, radio operators, because the enemy uh, would study the characteristics of the radio operators and each one had their own signature right and if they knew that one particular uh, operator uh, what ship he was on oh. they knew where that ship was going it's like it's like a direction <laughs> finder or something yeah they, they they would know if there was two ships getting together oh by the, uh, the, the signatures more ships yeah. Yeah. so they had to uh, like I say, clone them so that each one had the same uh, characteristic in their code. Yeah. And so that you and not individualized, tell. but consistently so, the same. Okay. Yeah. So that you couldn't t tell uh, who was who. They were more anonymous then. So that uh, so a lot of them went into that. Okay. Uh, one, after one didn't. Uh, this is kind of funny. It's a little bit off the beaten path here, but uh, I was called in to go to the uh, commanding officers, and so I, I went up there. No, as a matter of fact, they had an orderly come and take me. He took me uh, there, and uh, I'm waiting, uh, waiting in for my turn, and this one guy he wanted to ship out. He, he flunked the uh, tests and he didn't want to continue in radio school. He wanted to ship out, active duty. Yeah. Uh, no, they weren't going to. He actually pulled out a pocket knife and across the commanding officer's walnut or mahogany or whatever desk and you boom! Pulled at the closet knife. Up. I saw this. Yeah. Uh, and he was shipped out that evening. That, that did it. That, that. <laughs> he was shipped out. I uh, never never heard of him again. Wow. Uh, he was pretty serious. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, uh, it was my turn. At attention, you know, hat in hand, <laughs> uh, and the. the Bunch of these gold braids sitting there, questioning me, and uh, have I always lived in Chicago? And have I this and that? No. And I told them where I came from uh, because of the, the no money here, it was a bad times, and uh, um, have I ever gone under any other aliases? <laughs> No. Uh, they threw some papers uh, on the desk and uh, about the name Cherick. C H E R E C K. Oh, <laughs> oh that, uh, that's not legal. Uh, that was never changed. My father wouldn't change it because uh, the way we got the name Cherichovich. Uh, but it was so difficult uh, for people to pronounce or to spell it. Uh, and so 
uh, he used the name Cherik. And that's he, but he never made it legal either. So on places like the electric uh, bill uh -huh. or gas bill or wherever it wasn't important, uh, even at the gas station, I remember the man knew us as Cherik. So how did the Navy find it? Oh, geez, I heard they, they went. They went and talked to all the neighbors around. Oh, they did me. an investigation in the neighborhood. Yeah, oh, okay. they, they they knew me <laughs> better than my mother, I think. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, <laughs> I was kind of tickled with that. They couldn't figure out why they would use a name like Cherik from Cherohovich. Uh, I said, well. Can you pronounce my name? So, yeah. and, and they could Everybody had that problem. Yeah, so maybe they could sense uh, the, why, why there was some... Reason. I used it to my advantage in boot camp. Oh, I know about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it kept me off of some work details. <laughs> so, uh, what... So, anyhow, that satisfied them mm -hmm. why I was Cherokee. Yep. Instead of Cherohovich in some places. So there really wasn't any substance to that. Yeah, they thought, <laughs> I don't know what they thought. <clears throat> well, they, they didn't know either. And the said. fact that I was in uh, Poland and uh, yeah. Germany and yeah. those countries. <laughs> um, so what, what training came next after uh, College Station? After College Station, uh, went to... Uh, was it Wards Island? Cor pardon? Wards Island? Yeah, Corpus Christi, yeah. Co off of Corpus Christi, out there at the Gulf, of, a place called uh, Ward Island. Uh -huh. And uh, that, that uh, seems to have been a setting for planes, uh, uh, these uh, seaplanes. Yeah. Uh, although we had other planes there. Uh, was that a duty station or was that additional training for you? Was, pardon? I, was that a duty station or was that additional training? No, that was additional training. Okay. They had uh, some freshly built uh, barracks that were converted into classrooms. And everything was the same. I think they only had one set of plans, a barrack. And, oh. then, and then you made whatever you wanted inside. Oh, okay. And... Uh, also, there was the uh, Marines going there. Our barracks was next to the Marines, and uh, oh boy, there, there was always... <laughs> friction? <laughs> friction, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, what we the, did... The Marines know, they, can't get along with others, I guess. <laughs> no, when marching to class and oh. back, and the Marines always won out. Yeah. They always got the yeah. uh, banner, yeah. uh, so to speak. And, uh, what we did, one of our guys did, <coughs> is uh, he got a pair of uh, uh, waves bloomers uh, underpants, and he climbed the flagpole, and he tied it on the top of the flagpole. <laughs> well, you don't mess with the Marines' flag. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I thought there was going to be a war right there. So was Wards Island more uh, air tech training than, than the previous? Uh, no, that's where I was introduced to very secretive stuff. Oh, secretive. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff we weren't even supposed to uh, uh, mention. Like on uh, schematics, uh, it was indicated with a square and X. It was an X. And we had to memorize everything that was within the perimeter of that square. Yeah. And actually where it was, was the magnetron. Oh. Uh, they had developed a small magnetron that was light enough to be carried in a plane and as such meant that they could have radar in a plane. Airborne radar? Yes. Okay. Rather than the bulky units that were yes. on ships or shore stations. Okay. Uh, so you, you're getting qualified to uh, learn that equipment and 
maintain yes. it? Yes. And then I knew that it was something important, very important, because uh, when we go any place uh, on the weekend, if we got the weekend off, because they would check everything. If anything was dirty in the barracks, as if, uh, and I swear, sometimes the officer would come in with white gloves and go to the top of a door or something, and if he got a little bit of dust, I swear he brought that in yeah. from the he outside. He brought a dirty glove. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, so what were the consequences then? Pardon? What were the consequences of that kind of inspection? Fail? Uh, no liberty. No, no oh, liberty just confined to barracks? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no liberty that weekend. Well, not to confine the barracks, but to the base, anyhow. Yeah. Which, which was, uh, uh, you, you could go swimming there, but there was a lot of jellyfish and stingrays and all that. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Portuguese man of war, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was quite a place. It was alive with everything. So did you get your rating at Ward Island? Did you get uh, your uh, AET or one of those ratings? After I was, after I graduated. Okay. Yeah, because there was more to that than see. We, that's when they uh, discovered, invented the uh, absolute altimeter. Oh yeah. Which uh, prior to that, prior to that, they uh, used the uh, air pressure uh, altimeter. See, and there was a lot of. Uh, the adjustments and everything and it still wasn't accurate yeah. because the pressure changes from one place to another. Atmospheric uh, pressure? You mean? Yeah. So what, how, what, how did the absolute altimeter work? What was the absolute the altimeter was electronic. It would, it would shoot a signal down. Oh, an echo. And to come back up and they would measure how long it took to come back up and they knew you could figure how far away that was. Oh, it's kind of like how sun sun so, works underwater. So we could, uh, so we could tell uh, accuracy, <coughs> the plane up to, uh, well, they say six feet, but you didn't go there. You didn't dare go down to six feet because of prop wash. Your propeller would uh, pick up the water. Yeah. And, uh, but ten feet, because. Uh, uh, later on, when I was teaching, uh, uh, drop a, uh, I was going to say drop a fish. We used to call torpedoes a fish. Uh, to drop a torpedo on certain targets, you went down to 10 feet. And it was advantageous uh, to get as low as you possibly could because the gunners couldn't shoot straight down. Uh, right. And it was too difficult for them. So if you could approach a ship as low as possible at high speed, as soon as you drop the fish, uh, your plane would just shoot up and you'd go one way or another and get away from there mm -hmm. if you didn't get hit. So then you were, you were qualified uh, to operate and maintain the absolute altimeter? Yes, and it was very delicate. <laughs> uh, you had to... Uh, uh, you had to put it in the plane and uh, uh, had to have someone fly the plane. And, uh, oh, to validate it and, yeah, and, and, and the, calibrate it and everything. Yeah. And, and the new boys from England. Uh, oh, was, English pilots? Yeah, they, they, they were over. I don't know if that was their R&R &R or what. Well, they were over to learn uh, how to use the... Uh, the uh, uh, radar uh, in there because that was new yeah. to them. And everybody thought that you'd turn the switch and you'd see pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and all you saw is what we call an L scan. Yeah. Uh, so just, the vertical and the, and the horizontal line and the yeah. blips. Yeah. And, the, and the intensity or the uh, uh, amplitude or whatever it was. The amplitude yeah. of the blip, yeah. Uh, so so well, without, that was a big letdown to them. But anyhow, <coughs> getting back to adjusting the uh, altimeter, uh, we, we just, they would fly us out there and we'd work on it. 
uh, when I say we, uh, I. Was it on PBYs or on what, what type of aircraft? No, oh, no, no, the, 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 the Corsairs. Uh, oh, Corsairs. Uh, okay. Yeah. So these are fighters? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and uh, an another thing that uh, developed there uh, was the IFF. Identification friend or folk. Yeah. Uh, that was a very important. That's a, like piece a transponder, of like a transponder. Yeah. Uh, you would interrogate it. Yeah. And it would send a signal back, depending on what uh, code it was set to. Uh, like a, a rotating day. code. It had to be the current code or the, the well, code it, of the day. Or? It, 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 it was every day. Every day was a different code. Yeah, rotating code. Okay. And you were told that just a, a short time yeah. uh, prior to that, and uh, we used to call it the the farmyard because it sounded like a bunch of chickens in there. Uh, are, are you impersonating one? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, they would mount this uh, uh, piece of equipment uh, back in the tail of the plane. They actually had a compartment there with a the door, uh, open up, slide it in, away from the pilot, in case a pilot decides to defect. What? Oh yeah, in case a pilot wanted to defect, and you know the, the enemies try to get the equipment from you, yeah. knowledge from you, yeah. uh, and if they offered a million dollars, of course a million dollars back then was a, a lot of money, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now I guess Trump probably carries that much in his back pocket. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, those were very difficult to work on, extremely difficult. Yeah. Uh, they had seven detonators in them. And when they were made, they used a lot of, uh, not a lot, a number of tube sockets that weren't even a part of this IFF equipment. But they had wires going to them and away from them to other parts through, uh, through, through the uh, chassis of it. Mm -hmm. And they had tubes in them that would light, along with with the others. And these were all tubes in those days. There was no peanut tubes. They were all actual sized tubes. Yeah. And, uh, and they were quite hot. I'm sure. When it was when <laughs> it was done, the entire chassis was sprayed white. Now you've got the entire chassis wires sprayed white. You've got a bunch of things that don't belong to part of the equipment. And you said the wires go yeah, elsewhere. And the only thing you <laughs> had to uh, check any equipment with was uh, the volt ohmmeter. Mm -hmm. And a volt ohmmeter works on electricity. It had batteries in it. And so if you took the two leads and there's voltage on them, and you put them across, depending on how much you'd get, you could tell what the voltage was, what the resistance was, how many ohms, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, if you made a mistake, it would blow up. Now you go work on one of them. It sounds risky. Your, your stomach grinds. Oh. Uh, it's almost like you're uh, a, a bomb diffuser. <laughs> yeah. You know, John, with, with all this technical training, do you remember much about what the instructors were like? I mean, they, they must have had really a superior knowledge. I mean, the, they were older men. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were, they were, they were good men. Because it must have taken a lot of preparation to get all this training ready so so quickly into the war. And as new devices were being invented and discovered and... Well then then from there 
<clears throat> After I got my rig, I was uh, aviation electronics technician. I was legally in the Air Corps. Yes. Uh, I was uh, uh, <clears throat> a third class. Third class. And, but it was uh, the wings and the, on the thing. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I still have my blouse. No. This is a. This is not the one you had. This is probably from later on, okay. for the same rating, but later, maybe uh, after the war. Was yours round? Yes. Okay. So then, from there, from there, uh, it went to Georgia, Gainesville, Georgia. Now I know there's a Gainesville in Florida, but it wasn't that one. It's Gainesville, Georgia. It was north of Atlanta. Uh, yeah, and uh, went in there for uh, blind landing. Wow, even even more specialized training. Yes. Wow. Uh, how, how how many weeks does it take to learn that? Uh, yeah, that was some sensitive equipment there. Yeah. Uh, when when uh, getting ready to uh, talk a plane down, uh, everything has to stop on the base. It's a jeep or a <coughs> truck or. Oh, this is like a plane running out of gas or something like that? Well, if for some reason... Uh, or atmospheric. ...at the land, yeah. uh, heavy fog or yeah, something Yeah, atmospheric like problem. Okay. Um, and uh, they had uh, special men that had a soothing voice and uh, they would talk you down. They get, first, they had to gain your confidence mm -hmm. because uh, they used to spray paint the uh, canopy on the plane so that you couldn't see a thing. Oh. <laughs> couldn't see, you couldn't see a thing out of there and we were That would satisfied. force you to do blind landing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you couldn't see a thing anyway. And uh, they, they would uh, talk you down and you'd put your life into this man's Hands, he would uh, tell you where you're at. And of course, on the plane, they used to have the. Uh, uh, they, they would tell you uh, whether you're horizontal or yeah, uh, uh, and your altitude. And he would tell you to what altitude he wanted you to go. That so it's purely the lower, instruments only, no the visual. Lower, yes, and that and. Uh, <coughs> Well, I, I could tell you some stories about uh, <laughs> local men in a, just a regular civilian plane was running out of fuel and he called up Mayday and um, they couldn't send him on to Atlanta because uh, he wouldn't make it. And uh, This is while you were in Gainesville this happened? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, the... Uh, w w one of the men that does that uh, talking and playing down had to gain his confidence and the guy was reluctant to do that. He didn't believe there was such a thing that could bring him down and uh, at the last second he would abort and take off oh, again up in the air and this guy had to talk him back into him, uh, him approach. Relax him. Yeah. And they're, they're good at that. <clears throat> and it finally got him down. Almost like a hostage uh, well, negotiator situation. <laughs> in, in, his, in, his case, in his case, his windows weren't blacked out. Or no, he was no. just running out of gas. Yeah. Uh, but he got him down low enough to where the Bartow lights oh. were strong enough. So he had visual. Landing assistance. Yeah, yeah, that, okay. yeah. Once he got through that haze, close, close enough to the runway and the Bartow lights, because uh, the Bartow lights, they all shine, all of them along there shine at one point. Mm -hmm. they, uh, so you home in on that. Yeah. That. And so, so when he got out, he kissed the ground. <laughs> I remember that. It was on our watch that, that, yeah. that happened. So he couldn't believe you guys could do that. No. <laughs> Um. So, um, 
you you went through Gainesville and learned. Yeah, that the was good. That was good duty there because oh. uh, we didn't have to do our own uh, bunks or anything. We had waves for everything. Did, did all wow. the food served us? Uh, you were just in class yeah. or, or out in in yeah. live conditions. Uh, wow. So did you, uh, once you finished Gainesville with the blind landing and you had all the other technical training, did you move into a regular AET third class job then? Did you go back to Ward's Island or? No. Corpus uh, Christi? Well, back, going back to Ward Island also during that period, uh, there was a problem with the German U-boats. Oh, and uh, that and, were sinking a lot of our uh, uh, oil tankers, supply ships, and things like that. Com com yeah, can I, yeah. Coming from the refineries, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> no, going to the. Refineries. I mean, yeah, well, they're, yeah. Uh, because when they were going, they, they had a full load of uh, oil, uh -huh. and they were going to. Uh, oh, what the heck is that town? Uh, just, just above, uh, just above, uh, Houston? No, no, this Port is Arthur? on the coast. Port Arthur? On the, on the coast. Oh, well, well. I was going to get a map. That's okay. Um, so. anyway, the, 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 the U-boats would hang out around there, and as these tankers would come by, they would sink them. Right. So uh, they had us in between uh, going out and hunting, uh, use PBYs for that. Mm -hmm. and, oh, this uh, is to locate U-boats and then, yeah, and then, then message back to the, uh, to the, the fire destroyers. Yeah. Destroyers oh, would destroy go out there and, and uh, sink them. <clears throat> Although we could sink them too, but uh, they didn't have us doing that. Uh, so that was one of the things also we went to that as uh, aviation electronics third class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had. Uh, my p position in the plane was the starboard uh, blister. Huh? Uh, yeah, that was good. I had a lot of uh, shooting. I had to take the uh, 50 caliber apart on a oh. blanket. You know, yeah. they'd mess it all up and you blindfolded. You had to put the damn thing together. To make it operational again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So did, uh, did so, then, so then I went to uh, Gainesville, uh, Georgia, and then from Gainesville, Georgia, we were going up and down the coast, putting in blind landing strips. Oh. Yeah, we. Now, there there was a need for them. Pardon? There was a need for these blind landing strips along the. East coast of the yes, United States. Yes, I guess I guess they were using a lot of planes. Oh. Uh, and uh, at night. And, uh, Is it like patrol planes, coastal patrol planes, or or just? No, no, small planes. They were small planes, and uh, I really don't know what they. Well, uh, yeah, I do because they had <coughs> a lot of problems with. Uh, U-boats all along the coast. The Gulf and Coast so, and the East Coast. Yeah. 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 I know they're along Florida. Yeah, so so <laughs> they must have been out looking for uh, submarines and then they locally, wherever they'd be along the coast, they right. have to be able to land and then they don't want to use lights or anything because these guys are sitting out there off the coast with their periscopes looking for yeah. uh, such a thing as lights or uh, yep. uh, what have you. Uh, but blind landing, they still use those Bartoli lights, but those are focused. Well, they can get you down low enough, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. So uh, when, when you were stationed in Corpus Christi, did you ever get back to Chicago? 
You ever hitchhike back to Chicago? I don't believe. I, no, I don't think from Corpus Christi. I I did hitchhike from uh, when I was up higher on the coast, uh, uh, but not not from Corpus Christi that that I remember. Didn't you have that special map, uh, the U.S. map that servicemen had, so you could find your way hitchhiking? The service oh, yeah. Mates? Yeah. Yeah. I had, but you know, I don't remember hitchhiking. Oh. I assume you, you wanted to get home from time to time whenever you had leave. I, I do remember one thing from the... Uh, from the Ward Island thing, uh, and that was uh, one of the buddies was flying a, uh, a TBF, and uh, he was a lot of incendiaries, and I don't remember where he was going with those incendiaries, but the landing gear collapsed on takeoff. Oh. And, uh, oh my. And he had a bomb load. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, uh, Did you have to drop him out melted, over the it, it melted the entire plane except the cowling around the engine. Yeah. Uh, that uh, hide the exhaust on it. And uh, I made a uh, band for my wristwatch. I have that someplace. And that was made out of a special uh, metal on there. That, that's very tough because when I took it to the local jeweler there to have my serial number engraved in, when I came to pick it up, he says, I don't know what this is, but I wore a couple of heads down. <laughs> yeah, it's tough uh, material. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when were you transferred from uh, Texas to Camp Wellfleet? You recall that? Well, it was from from Georgia. Oh, you went from Gaines? Yeah, from Georgia, uh, the blind landing. Oh. And, and then, uh, before I got to Camp Wellfleet, I uh, had a, oh, I don't know how many stops along the coast where we put in blind landing strips. And also, in the spare time, if there was any, <coughs> we uh, uh, flew watching for uh, uh, submarines. No, okay. and, uh, so you, you kind of worked your way up to Cape Cod then? Right. Oh, okay. And uh, was uh, practicing, I guess we'd be, call it, using these sonic buoys. Oh, yeah. Uh, or that, where you would drop uh, oh, the three buoys <clears throat> in a triangle and then it would listen, listen for them uh, if they would any pulse get down there. And, uh, and they could have uh, location uh, information to uh, relay uh, back to I, I, I uh, worship? Did, I never did here. Oh. Uh, we heard it in the Gulf. <coughs> I, I heard one in the Gulf. And I heard some up around the, uh, up, uh, around the, mm, Iceland. Oh, Greenland, Iceland area? Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's where you're, uh, the ships would well, the convoys that would, go would get together on there, yeah, and then uh, with uh, a bunch of uh, destroyers around the side, and we would fly, uh, see that it was clear, and we would drop the buoys on there. And if you heard something, you'd you'd let the destroyer know, and they would go out to that place and. They had much better equipment. Um, oh, for detecting uh, submarines? Yeah. Okay. But at least that would be a tip off to concentrate on that area where the buoys picked it up, right? Yeah. Okay. So the main thing is, uh, it seemed to me like they were killing time. They didn't want us to get to Wellfleet. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it sounds like you had a lot to do. 
with the patrols right. as well as the blind landing installations. That's right. And, and it's only through, through reading that book that uh, I loaned you yeah. uh, on there that I really felt that that's what I was being groomed for from the beginning. Yeah. Because they were building something that they didn't know <laughs> what it was going to be. Yeah, yes. And they were teaching me. Yeah. No matter what it came out to be, I, I <coughs> we couldn't be, wait till it was all done to get you prepared. I would be able to fix it at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in between, uh, nobody loafs in the Navy. Nope. In the meantime, they had us do. Although I said nobody loafs in the Navy, after we got there, well, we, I think they forgot who the heck we were. Well, it was uh, what an army. Uh, it, it used to be an army. Uh, Anti-aircraft training, uh, uh, or uh, the anti-aircraft gun school. Yeah, I mean it was, it was like yeah, five thousand troops. For five thousand troops, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. And so that was a big place, and then we come in with I don't know, twenty or twenty five, I think. Yeah. Let's and see. Uh, <laughs> you could pick any barracks you wanted. Oh, they have. You could you know. do anything you wanted there <clears throat> around there, and we had the, the only gold bridge we had. Was a uh, uh, a ninety day wonder. Oh, an ensign. ensign. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so what what was the significance of this location, Wellfleet? What well, wasn't there some historical? Uh, uh, yes, yes, right, right in that place. That's where McCormick. Uh, Marconi. Marconi. Yeah. Uh, sent his first radio message that was picked up in England. Right. And that's the closest spot to England, from what I understood back oh, then. Oh, out on Cape Cod there. <coughs> yeah. In the, uh, near, near Provincetown, yeah. Yeah. And it was the highest. Oh, like, the elevation. Plateau, yeah. Uh, that the camp was on. Yeah. Everything else from there was lower. Uh, and, and I know when going down <coughs> to our uh, shack, uh, it went down a pretty steep sand cliff. Yeah. Uh, on there. So what, what were your some of your duties when you were at Wellfleet? What, what was the function of your unit? We had to keep the uh, we had radar units with that were shipped in boxes, uh, and uh, uh, actually they were shipped in real heavy foil uh, bags that were watertight. To where if, when they were, if they'd be aboard a ship and the ship got sunk, these things would float. Oh, it could they be could re recovered. Be, they could be recovered. Oh, okay. And every every radar unit came with five identical spare parts. Oh. One of the spare parts was a jeep. It came with five jeeps. <laughs> Jeeps, the, right, the Willys Jeeps? Yeah, Army Jeeps. Oh, okay. <laughs> so every radar unit came with five Jeeps. And we had, we had uh, we have about five radar sets there. Mm. And so you can picture how many Jeeps we had. Around. Everybody had a Jeep. Yeah, yeah. We the were running around. <laughs> And, and it came with a radio and transmitter. And if it broke down, you'd have another Jeep. <laughs> no, uh, actually, we drove around the things trying to get stuck. And if you did get stuck, you'd call somebody in another Jeep, where you at, you know, and yeah. they come and they pull you out. Those were marvelous instruments, the, those Jeeps. So did you interact at all with the British uh, Air Force? Oh, you're well fleet. Uh, well, other than the planes. Oh, the, the fighter the, planes. The yeah. planes and the pilots. Uh, the what happened was uh, it, it was during that time where uh, every time the planes left England for uh, German coast, uh, for every ten planes that of ours that left, only three would come back. Oh. And that was not good. Not yeah. good at all. 
Wow. And it was this radar that was going to solve all this problem. And so uh, after we taught the pilots how to read the, the uh, radar, and after we taught them how to uh, uh, interpret everything on there, and uh, one of the big things we taught them, uh, we had we had dozens and dozens of uh, scale model uh, ships and planes. They're black, like silhouettes. Who made those? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. They were shipped to us. These were and, U.S. and, and enemy we, ship and, models. And we were, yeah. Oh. And we would suspend them on real fine wires. Yeah. And there and <coughs> had this room that was totally dark. And you'd first go to the first room about fifteen minutes ahead and uh, sit there in the total darkness and talk and eat carrot strips. Every place you went you had little strips of carrots and a plate. Uh, and uh, you'd uh, uh, wait until your eyes adjusted, adjusted to, to the, the darkness. The just, yeah. And then you would go into this second room that was, uh, and you'd feel your way around, and, uh, and you would sit down, and they had a, they, they had a, a light that they would flash on there. I, I think we first started at tenth of a second. Oh, the pulse of the light was tenth of a second. Yeah, pulse yeah. of the light, tenth of a second, and you had to recognize, determine what kind of plane it was and what its wingspan was. Wow. Uh, you had to determine, is it our plane or enemy plane <laughs> important? So how, how many different uh, models were there? There were like a couple dozen or more than that? I mean, there must be an, enough, to, it wouldn't be one or two, it must have been dozens. I'm trying to think of the... <coughs> The uh, planes we had there. Uh, no, I, I'd say about uh, what we were concerned with it was about five oh. each. Oh. In that five area. enemy because and five it, yeah. friendly? There were more in boats. Bo boats, uh, battleships, uh, carriers, oh, the, uh, the, stuff like that. Yeah, they naval vessels. Models, models of that. Yeah. Right, how many stacks and where were the stacks and they were all at scale. Yeah, they were all proportional to uh, some scale. Wow. How um, how big was this no, room? No, they weren't. They weren't to that kind of a scale, evidently. No, they weren't. So hmm. how big a room was this that all these were laid out in? Like this room here. Oh, like uh, 25 by oh, this, 35? Oh, this is 20 by 22. Oh, so, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we, we had to be able to recognize the, the planes. And you had to know their wingspan because yeah. uh, their 50 caliber uh, gun uh, had uh, rings on it. And depending on the plane, before you would safely uh, squeeze the handlebar, the, like pulling a trigger, right? Uh, you you look through there until the wings on the plane were within the circle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then the range was okay to, to fire. Okay. And, so even, I, and even then you wouldn't hit. <laughs> so how how were you told it was a hit or a miss? How how it was? What well, was the feedback that it, that it had a strike or a miss? I never hit one. Oh well, somebody else must have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never hit one. Oh, but uh, you you would know because there was tracers. There was tracers. Uh, so how about the the remote control stuff? 
Weren't you, weren't you doing uh, aerial target practice with remote control items? Remember that? Uh, I don't recall. The PT boats? Oh, PT boats. Yeah. No, I was called out on that uh, to go. Uh, there, things weren't working, and uh, they would pull targets. So where for the planes to shoot at the target? Where was this down in the bay, or where where did they have these, uh, the, the, these model was, boats? The, this was done uh, uh, where I was called on the Gulf Coast. Oh, yeah, oh. this was done on the Gulf Coast. They took me out there and. See, we, we we went wherever someone had a problem with anything that they said wire attached. Uh, if it was a wire on there, that was ours. Uh, like, for example, uh, one ship I go was an English ship came in, and for some reason they're, uh, and they had their own radio men. It was loaded. Oh. And it was a big ship. Yeah. And uh, I had to go aboard, and they took me down to the hold where the transmitter was at. Oh my God, did it stink down there. It was vile. It, uh, but what was the all order? Our, all our ships were so clean and everything, and this was actually uh, filthy. Wow. And uh, I don't remember what I did, but I, obviously I must have fixed it, whatever it was. <laughs> Uh, so how did you say we with the PT boats? Oh, uh, I'd get them working to where they could pull their targets, and the planes would fly and shoot them. But every once in a while, the guy was too aggressive, and he went beyond the target, oh. <laughs> hit the PT boat. Oh, okay. uh, uh, and another one. So uh, the PT boats were pulling the target. Yes. So they were shot, but they, yes. okay. But he would wipe out the whole system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Another thing that was called upon on the base was uh, the fire engines. Fire engines, and then a lot of the jeeps had two-way radios on them, and so those had problems, so those were ours uh, to fix. Well, you kept busy. You had so many uh, things to work on. Yeah, oh, you think we didn't have anything to do. Do you remember <laughs> Helen Redding? She was... She was a vocalist. Australian uh, singer? Uh, she was a singer, a singer and uh, like a actress. That she made a plea over radio over a time. Uh, anybody had portable radios that didn't work. Yeah. Uh, please send them in to us there in Wellfleet, and we would fix them and, and issue them to people, poor people that didn't have anything, and et cetera, et cetera. My gosh, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe the, <laughs> I can't say it, uh, people would send, it was unfixable. Uh -huh. But, but you were expected to work on them and repair them? Yeah, to re we would repair them. So what was that? Uh, and and <laughs> put them aside, and the trucks would take them in uh, to distribute them to certain places. I don't even know where. Well, uh, so anything, that was one of the reasons that they couldn't jail us if we, if we did something Got in wrong, trouble. like yeah. I, I came back from a Christmas uh, leave, uh, I don't know how many days late, uh, those four of us came back, and uh, on the way back we hit a snowstorm, which, yeah, it was a snowstorm, but we, we could have made it. But uh, we were close by, uh, this uh, Bear Mountain Lodge, yeah, hmm. Bear Mountain Lodge, New York, and uh, we get to Bear Mountain Lodge and yeah, they put us up and very nice. Yeah. So we decided to call the base and collect, and the operators 
They have a collect call from Bear Mountain Lodge with <laughs> the charges. Why would they? There went my second class. <laughs> oh, really? I never got it. Yeah. I never got it. Never uh, got it on. Okay. <clears throat> that was an expensive place to stay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but see, actually, normally you'd, you'd spend uh, some uh, time in the brig on something like that. Oh, so. But they couldn't put us, in the, or couldn't put me in the other one. It was a motor back and I don't know. And uh, so what I had to do was, uh, in the middle of winter, uh, clean, wash and clean the uh, commanding officer's car, station wagon, a lot of wood. Yeah. Uh, but that that wasn't too difficult. That was your because, reprimand? To, because to... The, the, the motor wreck got me a pail of uh, press tone. Oh. And the uh, uh, rag, towel, and made, made the job cold, easier. Cold, colder than hell. Yeah. And uh, washed that car down real good. A couple <clears> of times it was so bad. And, uh, it shined. I'll bet. You wouldn't believe what a job that did. Yeah. Uh, Presto. Okay. <laughs> what? Uh, how did you transport the the secret radio and radar parts back and forth? What What, what did you use for that? Uh, to do, do what? To transport the secret radio and radar parts back and forth. Remember what you used for that? Remember the used trucks? Well, the, for the large radar sets, there was no problem. Uh, they were in these big eight-wheel trucks. Yeah. They were built, for, uh, at that time there was a lot of activity in the desert, and uh, they used desert tires. Oh. Them, uh, and so forth. Oh, on for the beach. like sand conditions? Yeah. Oh. I wonder if it shows on the... No. Uh, and uh, those were those were fun to drive over the beach. Uh, that was another thing that I did. <laughs> I uh, tried to take one of these trucks and see how steep of a uh, oh, sand bank uh, or a, a bank. And I either. got I got about a quarter of the way up, and all the wheels are grinding. Yeah, uh, this thing. and getting deeper. And the CO because. Uh, what the hell are you trying to do? <laughs> oh, the CO came out? Yeah. Oh. But what was your answer? I'm trying to get up to this. <laughs> uh, so did uh, did you take uh, pictures during the during your tours? Did you have a camera? Yes, I had a Bolsey, 35 millimeter camera. A Bolsey? Bolsey. B-O-L-S-E-Y, I think it's... Uh, Oh. It was a 35 millimeter camera. Yeah. And uh, uh, we, we had the bell bottoms at the time. Oh. And I, I would uh, shove them in the socks. Oh. Pull the socks out. See, yeah. a lot of the guys carried their cigarettes. And yeah, a little I pack, a little pack of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I carried a camera in my. Uh, not to all places, because there's a lot of places even I didn't take a camera. Yeah, because of the security. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to what uh, was it? Just black and white film back in those days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you have a, a really good cook there at Camp Wellfleet? Oh yeah, Charlie Spears, drunk on two beers. Uh, oh, his his nickname or a middle name, Charlie? <laughs> that's that's what we nicknamed him. He always had a case of beer in the cooler. Wow. Always. And uh, he'd treat you. He'd come around and there and there have have one. Wow. You must have been a popular guy then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in real life, uh, real life, in civilian life, yep. he was a hairdresser. Oh, you mean before the Navy or after, uh, later? Before, career? before the oh. Navy. Oh. And when he got into the service, they made a cook out of him. Yeah. He was a damn good cook. Because uh, most all our food that I recall was air dropped on there. Yeah, so it probably yeah. wasn't real fresh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. 
It was well, stored somewhere and then shipped to you. <laughs> uh, our, all our milk was powdered milk. Oh, and then we eggs. Had, we had to mix it with the water. Yeah. Then uh, cereals. We get a lot of all kinds of cereals and uh, powdered eggs. Uh, but the oatmeal was the worst for weevils. Uh, <laughs> it used to get these weevils in the oatmeal. Yeah. And uh, when you'd uh, pour this whitewash over them that they call milk, yeah. uh, you'd wait and the weevils would come up to the top, you'd take the spoon and you <laughs> And you know you got them now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then, then you'd have to stir this up some more and some more. A few more came up. Oh. But, um, you know, weevils are clean anyhow. Uh, they haven't been out, because there's no weevils in there when they package it. Right. Uh, I don't know what they do now these days. Uh, I had oatmeal there, the, the year old, in the box, and no weevils. Uh, unless they missed a spray or something or not. <laughs> Probably. So did you get any fresh, uh, fresh game, the Charlie uh, Hubbard? Well, the, the game, he must be referring to the ducks, I told you. Oh, about. ducks, yeah. Uh, one of the things that used to drop a lot, and I don't know why, uh, maybe it's because they didn't know what to do with it all, <laughs> was butter. Butter? Oh, they just more and more butter. Huh? Oh, tons of butter. Wow. And uh, so what Charlie used to do, was takes his butter, he had a deal made with a butcher in town in Orleans. Orleans, a, a town right, right close yeah, by. Yeah, it was a bigger town already. Yeah. And uh, he would trade butter for whatever kind of meat he could spare. Yeah. Board. Yeah. And he'd run home with the meat and we ate good that evening. Damn good. Wow. Uh, one time, we got low on everything, and there's no food forthcoming. I went with Charlie. Uh, we had a lot of ponds, you know, a lot of cranberry bogs and oh, stuff up like that. Oh, Cape Cod there, yeah. 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 Uh, and so, he would take uh, fish hooks on the line, and he'd put corn uh, and he oh. soaked the corn in alcohol overnight. And I don't know what the purpose of that, that was. Yeah. This was. I think maybe to make it float better. Oh, okay. I, I think that's, uh, I'm just guessing on that now. Yeah. I should have. So this was part of the bait? I, I the ducks would go for this? For the corn? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he'd float this corn out on the <clears throat> hooks. And these ducks would... We have this, you know, wait till they swallow it on there. And I know it, it's not an animal act to us there. But yeah. uh, yeah. you got a bunch of ducks going back. Man, did we eat that night. How did he, did he prepare the ducks? For yes, oh, okay. yes, yes. Uh, he, he, he skinned them. He didn't pluck the feathers or anything. He skinned them. Yeah. Uh, and cleaned them and... It was very good. Pretty he, good for a hairdresser. Par, pardon? Pretty good for a hairdresser. <laughs> uh, he was a very good, very good. Uh, every once in a while he'd bake something. Uh, hmm. did, did you have your own car while you were there on Cape Cod? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I got a picture of it. Yes. Uh, we used to go to a Gin mill, I call it a gin mill. It was a club. Yes. Club. Uh, in Orleans, directly across the street from the theater at that time. And it was called the Four Aces. Yeah. And in the Four Aces, it was a nice club, a nice bar. Uh, and uh, go to this uh, Four Aces. And we would drink whatever we could afford, which at the time was large bottles of Pickwick Ale. Okay. And uh, it had a pretty high alcohol content, and so uh, we used to call it poor man's liquor. 
Uh, and there was this, uh, there's a lot of rich people on Cape Cod. There was at that time, I don't know now. And this one older gentleman used to love to meet us and uh, sit there and drink with us and buy uh, to a degree. That's nice. And we said we couldn't always come there because uh, it was hard to get a ride. It was kind of far to walk. Mm. It, it took uh, over an hour walking. To walk, yeah, then we have to walk uh, back. There. Yeah. yeah. And uh, walking back at the night, is the, 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 at that time, there was no lights, no nothing. Actually, fortunately, there was a road cut through there. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, one, well, anyway, I'm getting back to the car. Um, he said, you know, I've got, I've got a car in my chicken coop sitting there. He said, you're welcome to that. As far as I know, it, it, it drove. It ran uh, with, uh, before I put it away. It was, okay, well, I don't know if it was the next day or when it was the next day that I could. Yeah. It took a Jeep. Now, that was a nice thing about that base. You could go and come and do whatever you wanted, dress the way you wanted. We had no codes we had to follow mm -hmm. because there was there was no one to enforce the yeah. uh, rules. Yeah. So uh, I took the mechanic with me, and we went there, and uh, went to this old chicken uh, coop. Oh my God, was it loaded with chicken poop? <laughs> oh. Uh, it, it was a mess, but uh, all all four tires were flat. And uh, the mechanic uh, opened up the side, uh, the engine cover, the curtain for the, the, the hood. Yeah. It was a eight-cylinder engine. Big V8, huh? With porcelain, porcelain exhaust uh, manifold. Porcelain. Wow. So he says, oh, this is good. And he knew right away that was the first car that uh, uh, LaSalle, the, the first V8 had uh, hydraulic lifters. Oh, yeah. Well, after sitting for such a long time, the only oil had dripped out and everything, that thing. <laughs> it's pretty noisy. Yeah. Had, because uh, we bought, he brought a battery with him, uh, which we used to start the car, and gas, and he had to pour gas in the carburetor. And, uh, he was a good mechanic. Sounds uh, like he was essential for this. <laughs> he said, uh, oh, "This is good. This is good." Oh. Uh, they used to call me Cherry. Uh, because of the last name Cherahovich and then he's took hey Cherry. Uh, so, uh, okay, we uh, pumped up the tires, yeah. but I needed two tires on that car before I could go any place with it. Yeah. Huh. These were huge truck tires. Split rim, split rim, uh, on it. and uh, I got one tire in Boston. I hitchhiked, <laughs> hitchhiked. Can you imagine me hitchhiking from Cape Cod all the way to Boston. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, picture me hitchhiking with a tire. <laughs> <laughs> Who would pick you up? <laughs> uh, some truckers, you know. People at that time. Oh, during the war, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I bet I bet I never waited more than ten minutes for a ride. Oh, okay. Uh, Different times, right? <laughs> yeah. So I was able to get one tire, and then I was able to get one tire in New York. So I had four tires on the car, and yeah. gas 
for the Navy gas, yeah. <laughs> Navy oil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what he did was uh, uh, pour fuel oil into the crankcase uh -huh. and start it up, yeah. run it out, drain that down on the sand. Yeah. And I think he did that twice to clean it out real good and then fill it up with good Navy oil. Wow. And oh, that thing ran beautiful. Oh. It ran beautiful. The inside of the car, incidentally, the body was brass. The fenders were iron. Yeah. Uh, real heavy iron. The brass? Well, uh, that must have been expensive. Uh, it was. A, a, a 34 LaSalle Custom. Yeah. Uh, so how did you ever decide on the price, the sale price? Uh, $350. Oh, you just threw I got them? The, I got the bill of sale yeah. uh, on it. Yeah. And the car was 5,765 pounds, I believe. The, Three tons. Because uh, uh, that's another thing I had to go to Boston uh, for it, to get the license for it. Oh, okay. And you can't get a license without insurance. Oh, yeah. And the insurance, no, no, the, the license was by the weight of the car, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, I paid through the nose on that. Yeah. Um, but I got all the thing legally, had insurance on it. Because you had to have the insurance, or you couldn't, you could get the license. Right, right. Couldn't get a plate. Uh, and the uh, tellers were in the same building, only on opposite walls. You went to one teller's cage, and then you went back to the other teller's cage, and here's the insurance giving my license. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that was a good deal, because, uh, oh, I, I was in like this. Uh, Any time the commanding officer Oh, you, the car. you found out about your car pretty soon, huh? <laughs> it was probably pretty... <laughs> Anytime you needed a car, you know, polish up his gold braid and go into town. Uh, the, the women there were wild. And uh, so I let him use my car. Wow. It, it was good. But now, but now you had a ride to the Four Aces. Yeah. You didn't have to, uh, not have to walk there or take a bus or... So one how time, many, did people one, jump, jump in with you then? Did you have a, quite a few people that wanted to ride with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did. Yeah. Uh, one, one time when we were walking to, <coughs> to the town, we, it was a, pretty close to Orleans already, uh, there was a dead skunk in the road. Now, that, that's odd there because that road was gravel. There was no, no blacktop at right. that time that I recall. And uh, we had a long branch. We picked that uh, skunk up yeah. and we went into town and uh, there was a movie house directly across the street from... From the Four Aces. Uh, right? From the Four Aces. <clears throat> and in the back was the air intake <laughs> for a... Cooling system. They had water dripping over some fins or something, and the air running over it was cooled and yeah. clammy. And that. Yeah. Well, we threw it in there. <laughs> and then we went across the street, sat down, ordered our beer, and we watched, <laughs> we watched the show evacuate. Oh, yeah, well. Yeah, but if you had to carry it in your car, wasn't there some residual? No, this was before we had the car. Oh, this is old. Uh, yeah. You just picked it up off the, the roadkill on a right, stick. Right, then we walked it. a safe distance. We okay. walked it. Oh, okay. Uh. <laughs> so, John, did, did you have any memorable secret missions or covert activities that you were willing to disclose while you were in the Navy? I'll tell you what used to be my worst. <laughs> my, my worst was... Uh, fortunately, that wasn't that often. We were called upon to uh, to uh, go with a uh, convoy. Oh, see, but we only go out halfway, and the boys from England would 
take it from they there. Take it from there. Yeah. This is up to Greenland or not that far? All around Iceland. Ice oh, Iceland. Yeah. That's pretty far over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, it was safe there. The boats didn't mind going there because there was no U-boats seen in that vicinity. They were all afraid of the icebergs. Yeah. And it was loaded. I don't know. I understand it's getting warmer and warmer. And further up, further uh, up, yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't even know if they have any icebergs. I don't know. Yeah, I, I read where even the, the South Pole, the big chunk broke off and it's All the, floating somewhere. The Ross Sea or something like that. Yeah, that big Rhode Island sized piece of ice or something. <laughs> uh, even though that PBY is a good plane, but you got to remember that it was. It was a 1933 design. Oh, so it's sort of age. 1933 design. In, and it, in it the was, mid 40s. <laughs> and it was a. Uh, uh, oh, what do you call it? The, the top wing. The wing was on top. Mm -hmm. This actually would be so you could. For yeah, search, visibility. For search uh, yeah. reasons, yeah. Uh, the only, the only time the wing would be in the way uh, would be if you had to use the blister, the left or right blister. Then either the wing or the tail was in the way. So they had stops for those uh, so that you wouldn't hit your own wing. <laughs> um, so anyhow, we would accompany these... Uh, ships, boats, and uh, you get pretty far out and we, we had a, uh, uh, what do you call uh, the, uh, I should have taken another pill. <laughs> uh, The navigator. Okay. You ask the navigator how, how far to the nearest land. It was always the same. Two miles. They'd be pointing down. <laughs> They'd be pointing two miles down. <laughs> uh, but there was a there was a number of. Uh, there was a number of uh, uh, spots in the ocean that are like little islands. Uh, they're too small to, to land on or to, to do anything to with. Yeah. Yeah. But there are. Uh, I guess the ocean isn't all like that. I understand the Pacific has places you can step out on. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, that used to bother me because the plane was old. Even at that time, it, I was considered old. <laughs> uh, and uh, like, any, like any engine, every once in a while you get a little water in the gas or something, it would sputter, you know. Yeah. Uh, you I think it might fail did, then. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, it's a seaplane, but you can't land in the, uh, the Atlantic rough Ocean. water, that kind of water. Yeah. Uh, I, I can tell you an incident that's gory. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm trying to decide whether I should even mention it. Oh, okay. Uh, a lot of... The servicemen uh, locally in Texas, and there's a lot of them there. There was two young boys that came over. They wanted to ride in the seaplane, a PBY. Mm -hmm. And they qualified as a gunner uh, on there. And uh, which I guess didn't take much to qualify, especially if I made it. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, what 
they had to do was to sit, there were stools, place for stools, behind the navigator and the pilot. Yeah, okay. Not, not the navigator, the navigator was that center thing. The, uh, the co-pilot. Little, little jump seats? Well, they weren't the seats, they were stools. Okay. They sat on there. And uh, they took off and everything was fine. And uh, on the way back, the, the water was a little rough. That, that seaplane hit a wave. Hit oh. a wave. They went right through the deck. Oh, on those stools? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, decapitated. Both, both of them? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, on a lighter note, you, as, as you've mentioned and I've mentioned, you have a very long 12-letter last name that's not easy for everyone to pronounce. So, uh, were there times where you really took advantage of your last name by uh, using a different <laughs> name and then because... Well, you, you were, uh, in boot camp... Oh, in boot camp, okay. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't go... Uh, I think you got about a 10 minute break during the day to take a smoke and that yeah. was in the smoking area. Yeah. And otherwise they always found something for you to do. Yeah. Always. If nothing else, uh, uh, because if you did something bad that you had to wash the latrine, the bathroom, as it's called today, with a toothbrush. Scrub it with a toothbrush. Uh, you know, playing games. But uh, there was also coal delivered there. Uh, and uh, they, they used to get these cattle wagons loaded up with the men in the morning and take them out through the woods up in there and let us all out and they have shovels, and you had to shovel that coal onto the trucks, and they drove that over to the base and used that to heat hot water and steam heat and whatever else, I don't know. They probably used it in the kitchen. Uh, well, let me tell you, the next time in the morning when they muster and calling out names, if they didn't pronounce my name right, it wasn't you. After everyone's gone and the cattle wagon was <coughs> gone, yeah, I mosey over to them and said, uh, "Oh, did you miss me? Uh, on the list, what's your name? Cherkovich." Yeah. Yeah, here it was called. I don't know what you called, but it wasn't me that you called. <laughs> and was, okay, so I went back to the barracks, and there's always someone around. But at least it wasn't cold that day. No. <laughs> so, so uh, when when did you buy red socks and suspenders in a protest? Yeah, see, when the war ended, uh, they they let the uh, men out according to points. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you were overseas, you had so many points for that. Right. If you were uh, in shooting, this is, you got Combat. points for that. Combat, yeah. For your age, you got points for that. For your whatever you did, you got points for everything. Yeah. Uh, I didn't qualify for overseas. Halfway there. <laughs> yeah, correct. Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway there. Uh, but one of the worst things that I say is every time I went out on one of those duties, my stomach was bad for a couple of days. Uh -oh. uh, when we left the boats and we left everyone else and we were out there alone in the damn water and you knew that you can't land, in that, that, that water's too rough. Yeah. And you knew that it was two miles to the nearest land. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I was. I was always sick. Huh. Uh, I hated that duty. But uh, it was duty. Uh, yeah, let's, let's see, where was I then? Red Sox yeah. and suspenders. Oh, yeah. Uh, any technicians that were any good were gone because they had the most points uh -huh. for everything. Well, I had to do everything. I don't care what it was from from somebody's portable radio to the uh, uh, fix the uh, radar. And then, oh, one thing we did do, the Model 270 radar, which is low frequency, that was about, it was good at a little over 100 miles under mm. ideal conditions. Yeah. Uh, we took that low frequency radar and we lengthened the pulse, uh, the, the transmitting pulse. I don't remember how much we... Of course, I, I would have no way of knowing how long a pulse because it's just through manipulating condensers and resistors. And we dropped a signal off the moon. Yeah? And we were able to determine how long it took. As a matter of fact, I think it appeared, somebody saw it in a, uh, of that time, a mechan uh, popular mechanics oh. magazine. Yeah, an article in there about yeah. Yeah, this. Test? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was us. Oh, okay. Oh, another thing that we did, uh, they used this for, uh, I don't know if you ever heard the bread basket. That was a bomb that uh, instead of one bomb down, it, was a pulse. it had little compartments around yeah. with smaller bombs. Yeah. And it was designed to spin and the tension put on so that it would, those doors would fling open at a certain altitude. Oh. And these things would spread out so one plane going straight could bomb. It really the extended series. the range of the bombing. Yeah. The effect of the bomb. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So we were down below taking pictures of all this as, as, as these things were going left and right. Wow. Uh, we was made some use there. <laughs> Another thing I hated was uh, a little ways down the coast towards P Town. Towards Provincetown? Yes, yeah, okay. Provincetown. Okay. Uh, was a Coast Guard station. And they were protecting us. And they had all these, uh, that was their purpose there. They were uh, using. Uh, uh, German Shepherds and Dovermans. And comes evening, and, and they had a, a barracks by us, it was donated to them, uh, to where they kept the dogs that were going to be used that night. And, uh, oh, the way they train those dogs, it's, it's terrible. That's a shame. And then, <clears throat> if you're ever confronted by a dog, you just freeze. Mm -hmm. so that dog will stand there and growl until one of them uh, comes over and releases you. Let me tell you, in the black of night, <laughs> you're walking and you're one little red light on top of one of the uh, buildings, we call them buildings, those shacks, and you head for that, and you walk out, and you know that before you get there, you're going to be challenged by one of these dogs. Yep. You never get over that. They were, they were miserable. <laughs> uh, those are things that. Uh, Hard to get. Although we did have a little entertainment in, in those shacks, uh, we would take 
uh, for entertainment, we used to uh, take a, an old magnetron, and they had magnets in them that were very powerful. Mm -hmm. And that was about the time when we had those silver zinc uh, covered pennies. Mm. Yeah. They were steel, and they were attracted to uh, magnetism. Yeah. But we placed that at one end of the room, and at the other end of the room, We'd take it and we'd roll, roll the penny and we'd roll it in another direction and we'd watch that thing right, right to that magnet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like they had those anti-magnetic wristwatches during the war. Yeah. I had one and it took the hands right off. It, it was anti-magnetic. The works was all good. Yeah. But the hands were... For metal, yeah. Metal. Yeah. And it just pulled Lifted it right, right off the face? Yeah. My gosh. So during the war, uh, during all these tours of duty, uh, how did you uh, stay in touch with your family back home? Letters. Uh, write a letter. And uh, you always only use one side of the paper because only half of the letter would get there. They had every letter... Uh, looked over real good and they had razor blades and they would cut out, they wouldn't scratch out or anything, they would cut out certain words, sentences or whatever they felt shouldn't wow. be included in the letter. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of that. So what did your fellow guys do for entertainment? Did you have the you USO tours and things like that? Yeah, what, what kind of tours? The USO tours, I think. Um, well, if you could get down to, uh, to Boston. Boston or New York, yeah. Oh, so it was that far away. Okay. Yeah. The, the, I mean, other the, than the four aces, was there much else? To... <laughs> otherwise, you went to the four aces. <laughs> Did you get much leave at all to get back home or to just to get away from Cape Cod? Well, at Christmas time, I had a week. Oh. Uh, and... Uh, I didn't have the money yeah. to, uh, to go home. Yeah, cause you I spent it on the car. Uh, well, that too, yeah. But <coughs> what I used to do is buy a lot of clothes, and I didn't wash much of anything. I sent it home. <coughs> oh, See, my it. brothers, my two brothers, uh, wore the same size shoes, and my father included. We all wore the same size shoes, and those were good shoes, Floresheim. Okay. If I needed money... I went into the town and uh, got a job spotting pins in the bowling alley. Oh, okay. And uh, I spot pins, and uh, a lot of times I get tips. Uh, that I made enough money, I would uh, hitchhike home, and I always had money. A actually, I always had money, uh, but one way or another, I found uh, you know, saved it. Well, like I said, I spent most of my money uh, on clothes because my mother had trouble getting, like, undershirts, shorts, yeah. uh, everything, socks for my Short dad, yeah. my dad and my brothers. And uh, we were a very patriotic uh, family because uh, I was in the service at that time. Uh, my father was uh, working on the uh, on the building at uh, uh, it was called the Douglas Douglas Airport originally. Oh, in uh, in um, Elmhurst? No. Oh. Uh, O'Hare. Oh, the O'Hare was called Douglas. It was called Douglas. Oh, okay. And. Uh, uh, it built a huge, huge uh, factory there yeah. that they were building the planes. And my mother was a riveter because she was small yeah. and agile. So they put her in the tail. She's crawling back into the tail oh, and back up the rivets. And they had a way of communicating back and forth. With so many knocks, <laughs> oh, you know, go left, yeah, right. Nonverbal communications. <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
<clears throat> that, and my brothers got jobbed in the lunchroom uh, in, the, in the cafeteria uh, as bus boys. Mm -hmm. So we had full employment. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody was making money. Yeah. You remember a number of your missions were a little precarious and you were in situations that were dangerous. Did, did you have any casualties with your unit? Any people well, lost? One, one of them was on that, uh, the hell was that, uh, plane, uh, the Widowmaker. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, that, that uh, double fuselage plane. Oh, the, the P-38 Lightning? Yeah. Or the P-61? Oh. Uh, the Lockheed Lightning? Yeah. Okay. It, it had... Uh, it had a cannon in one nose, and it had the, oh, the uh, it had the radar uh, dish in the other one, and uh, uh, so we were working on it, and one of the men passed by it too close, and the uh, power uh, went through his cheek into his filling, silver filling in his mouth. Oh my gosh! And from the outside, you could hardly see anything. It was just a little pinhole. Yeah. But it cooked the entire inside of his mouth out. Oh my gosh. Uh, took, they took him to the hospital. I don't know what the hell, the hell they did. Um, <clears throat> so do you recall where and when uh, you were, were during the uh, dropping of the atomic bombs? Do you remember where you were? How you uh, found out about it? Well, let's see. Yeah, I had to have been, I had to have been there one point, yeah. because my buddy uh, was uh, on the B-29 uh, there that the planes came from, and he just passed away, uh, he just passed away about uh, three weeks ago. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. Someone you served with? Pardon? Someone you served with in Camp Wellfleet? Well, no, he he was no, he was in the Army Air Corps. Okay. He was uh, Army Air Corps. He was an engineer. Uh, he was uh, one of the big things is uh, he was sitting on the engine, uh, working on the cylinder heads, and uh, he always had to watch for the fighter planes to come, and they would jump off, and get into their, uh, they had trenches built in the uh, angles. Oh, like a slip trench or something? Yeah, so uh, depending on which direction the plane was coming from, yeah. <coughs> you could go to the other side so that it wouldn't hit you. Right. And so and he passed away now about three weeks ago, I believe. Wow. Maybe four. <coughs> So when the war wrapped up, how, how did you return to Chicago? Well, I was uh, discharged finally when I got enough points. Uh, yeah, I, I got so teed off that I, they had me doing everything. Yeah, it took months uh, and months uh, before uh, you could actually uh, get every, Everything on there. That I walked and rolled, with my pant legs rolled up, red, shiny, socks that I purchased and red suspenders. Go ahead, <coughs> do whatever you want with me. <laughs> they couldn't. <coughs> well, you, had, you had very diminishing ranks at that point, right? <laughs> yeah. So, what? so I got discharged at the Boston Navy Yards. Oh. Uh, Not far from where the Constitution is. And uh, I'm trying to think of who was there, who was there and made music for us. <laughs> they had tables set up yeah. and everything, wanted us to re-enlist. They, ne they needed uh, electronics men badly. Oh, yeah. oh, that's right, that's right, yeah. yeah. Well, you, had, you had some really unique skills that you had acquired and put to use. Yeah. And, uh, they tried to give 
and the only thing they could give us was they would uh, increase our rate. One or two. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't remember. You now. get a promotion that way just yeah. to try to retain you. And they would give us a complete wardrobe, new wardrobe, which was money because you had to buy it yourself. Yeah. And uh, you had so much time off, and they tried to make it look good. Yeah. But my buddy, we enlisted, and it wasn't. It wasn't long after that he found himself in Korea. <laughs> Oh boy. So. Yeah, yeah, four more years in Korea. Yeah. So, there, what, was there much of a homecoming in Chicago when you returned? Yeah, my mother gave me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I, I, came, I came home and uh, I never did collect the uh, uh, 5220, I think they call you get twenty dollars a week for fifty-two weeks. I never did collect any of that. Uh, I didn't believe that. My father never believed. He always said, "You work for what you get." And uh, I went to work. The, my very first job that I could find was uh, uh, at the Acacia Park Cemetery digging graves. Um, that was a job. Jesus. Uh, the first spade was fairly easy because it was all black dirt mostly. Yeah, topsoil or, yeah. But then, you went four more spades down because you had to go five spades. Those were 14 inch spades and you had to go six feet. You could, they have what they call an Illinois gumbo. It's like a blue, bluish, wet clay. You stick the spade down in there, jump up and down on it. Hell, you can't pull a spade out, let alone with uh, dirt on it. Yeah. Uh, those were hard. It took all day to dig one grave. Oh my gosh. Uh, they didn't have uh, these. Uh, uh, these mechanical uh, oh, the, shovels. The back holes and back the holes. shovels, yeah. steam shovels and stuff, yeah. <clears throat> so did, did yeah. you did you make uh, any close friendships while you were in the Navy? Oh yeah, yeah. The last one died three, three oh. or four weeks ago. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I had, Stan, in my outfit, uh, Stanley Wojciechowski, he died uh, Christmas, uh, yeah, right after Christmas, I spoke to him before Christmas, called him up, and uh, <coughs> his daughter uh, let me talk to him, and uh, right, right after Christmas, uh, I got a call from her that uh, Stanley passed away. Oh. That's so, uh, did you join any? He was a good. He was a good technician. He was a technician like yourself. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he had the AET rating. Yeah. Okay. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations after the war? Not until <laughs> recently. Oh, that was okay. Not until recently. And by recently, I'm talking about. I think I'm with them four years. Mm-hmm. With the American Legion? Yeah, American yeah. Legion. I, I think I joined about four years ago. And uh, I found uh, more closer to my age uh, there. Yeah. And a uh, good bunch of fellows. Yep. Uh, and what I like about it is that uh, even though they were all uh, with scrambled eggs on their uh, visors, and they're, yeah. just, but they're they're just like uh, regular guys. Regular guys. Uh, yeah. No one, uh, no one has a Any rank. Role. You know, yeah. no, no <clears throat> difference in rank. Yeah. Because all, all my time in the service, uh, all I ever had was a uh, dancer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on a, wherever, I, wherever I went. Yeah. <clears throat> 
I didn't even know how to salute until I got in the, <laughs> in the American Legion. <laughs> Were you, were you able to apply all that naval aviation and electronics training experience after you uh, discharged? You know, to, to, to work? Yeah. I tried to, because I liked the work. Yeah, yeah. I liked the work. And uh, I went over here to the Milwaukee airport, as it used to be. And then there was a couple other little airports. And uh, I told them what I did. It was, oh, no. We got, we got nothing like that. We got nothing uh, for you. Well, okay. Uh, so, uh, there's three other guys from uh, almost the same block. So we lived on Henderson, Henderson and Long. Uh, we all came back about the same time from the service, the ones that came back. And uh, they couldn't get any work any place either. Yeah. Well, I had a 1933 Plymouth, but it was in good condition. And uh, we overhauled the car and decided to go to Alaska. We'll get some land there and we'll <laughs> farm it. Yeah. Because that's what the government was telling us to do. Yeah. <clears throat> well, after we uh, we, t we told the Bell Park Autos what we were planning, yeah. he sent his mechanic from the store over to guide us. And anything we needed, he sold us at whatever mechanics cost. Yeah. And uh, uh, we, we, we took the battery cage out, it was in the floor, uh, and enlarged it. Uh, we got the case from a Chrysler, which used a larger case and battery, because we knew we were going to have trouble up there. And that was a six volt system. Oh. And that, that, that's pretty rough in the winter's times. And uh, we. Uh, uh, built a trailer. My father helped us build a trailer. We went to all the uh, world, uh, war surplus stores along the division and Milwaukee Avenue, and there was plenty of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we bought a 9 by 12 house tent with the floor. Huh? We uh, bought well, we went downtown to VLNA and bought rifles and revolvers, and that was a chore because uh, before we could get them, the police, we had to go on 11th and State Street, the police uh, headquarters, and they would run a check on us. And that took for like forever. They would come around and, and ask our neighbors about us. Oh, question, uh, yeah. Yeah. What are they up to? And not like today, you can go and buy a damn gun and <laughs> shoot someone. Yeah. <coughs> then they ask questions. Though. Yeah. Uh, and then <clears throat> we had trouble getting through uh, Canada uh, on the Elkan Highway. Highway. The only thing is, they didn't have to cut the trees down in front of you. They they bulldozed they bulldozed and and dynamited them and whatever else they did to them, and they went through with a big blade, oh. so you didn't have to uh, take the, the topsoil off or anything, because um, that was in nineteen. Uh, 46. 40, 46, 47? 46, 47, right. <clears throat> uh, so the highway was open already, I think, the third year when I went. There wasn't six inches of asphalt. It was all whatever the terrain was, gravel, 
mud, uh, rock, uh, like that all the way. And like I said, you didn't have to cut the trees down. But you know what they did? The trees that they took down, they piled them off to the side. So when you stopped, you couldn't pull off the road to, no. to go up in there to use the bathroom facilities. Yeah. Uh, because all this lumber is piled up on both sides of the road. Yeah. Uh, whenever we came to an area that was open, yeah, we'd stop there and we'd go around. And uh, uh, the 22, 22 rifle was the only one that didn't have a uh, key a lock on Safety it. Safety lock, yeah. Yeah, because. Uh, uh, the Canadian uh, Mounties police, they uh, locked everything and uh, you weren't allowed to take it off. But, you know, we got out of ways. We, uh, there's one guy, he was in the Marines, and uh, we, we finally made it. Uh, to Alaska? Yeah, we only went through uh, 12 tires. Well, I was, I was going to ask you how you got gas all the way up there. Well, that was another problem. <clears throat> <coughs> the uh, uh, the army would drive a truck down the Elkan Highway, mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, there was these sourdoughs that uh, lived in there. They had their cabins. And the army was to give them an oil tank, a big one out in front of their house, fill it up, and yeah. they could sell it uh, by the gallon. And uh, you poured it to, into a can. The stuff didn't even smell like gasoline. We had to stop and clean our carburetor out about every third day. Wow. Uh, it's one of the things that we had to satisfy the uh, mounted police. Oh. Uh, they gave us a list this long of everything that we had to have spare. Oh, oh. So to, to travel they, travel on their highway. So they wouldn't have to come rescue after you. us. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, well, some of the things that I remember on there is. You had to have so many tires uh, and tubes in the tire repair kit because that's when they used the t uh, tubes. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, but the tires didn't wear out. It's the uh, granite so sharp that it would puncture, it would just break up your tire. You had a perfectly good tire. You put it on just a couple hours ago and piece of granite went through it. Wow. Uh, another thing, uh, you, you had to have, I think it was 200 feet of copper wire, bare copper wire. See, along the Elkan Highway, they had a, uh, they had these uh, telephone poles yeah. That uh, even I think I could have reached <laughs> the top. They were short. Yeah. Uh, up there, and they ran all along. And if you had any kind of a problem, uh, like medically, if you had a appendicitis attack or uh, anything that we, you couldn't go any further, you took this wire, uh, wrapped a rock around with them, and you threw it over the wire. And that was uh, a uh, signal to ground at, at the nearest station. Yeah. And they could determine exactly where you were. Yeah. Uh, Cross it back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, had to have a spare, uh, well, all the carburetor or carburetor parts. Distributor, distributor parts, uh, belts, fan belts, or whatever kind of belts your car used. Uh, 
Anyhow, on the uh, 33 Plymouth, it had a carrier on the back, and we built a box to sit on top of the carrier, and that was all our uh, that was all our uh, tools and parts, everything for that. Yeah. On top of that box, we had screwed down a meat grinder. Yeah. So anything we shot, we, we had cleaned it, and, rifles. It, and we <laughs> ground it, and we had patties. Uh, at VLNA, we bought uh, all stainless steel <coughs> utensils, cups, forks, knives, everything. <coughs> because one of the worst things that could happen there is you get poisoning from rust. Oh, everything okay. rust while you watch it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, at VLNA is where we purchased all our guns. Mm -hmm. Rifles. Um, geez, I used to remember all the guns we had. I don't know if I even recall them now. I had a forty-four Colt with a eight-inch barrel. Wow. <laughs> Oh geez, uh, yeah, 44 Magnum. It, it was, it, it was. Well, you, you see, if you one of the one of the worst rifles that has killed more people than anything else there is the 3030. Winchester. We, or what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 3030 caliber. It <clears throat> it would injure the animal, but like a bear, for example. He'd get you before you would die. Yeah. He would eventually die, probably depending where. Just, just bleed, but uh, so. Yeah. yeah, you you had us have something that would break bones or yeah. uh, whatever. Take the animal out. Um, yeah. What the sourdoughs <coughs> up there in Alaska used is uh, uh, a shotguns, double barrel shotguns, where they cut off the barrel, pretty sure. And they'd cut off the stock at the pistol grip point. Yeah. And they used to have uh, three balls. The, the shotgun shells had three lead balls in them. And they used to have that wrapped in the old underwear, wool and underwear, that kept it dry. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, <coughs> if you were attacked, you had to hold off until he was almost on you, and then uh, point it and pull the trigger and <laughs> run like hell. You hope for the best. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's see what else. Uh, let's see. I, I told you that they we, we couldn't get the we couldn't get the. Uh, 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 Guns right away. They had to check us all up and down. Oh, waiting period. All the, all the, <coughs> took a lot of time. The, it, the preparation that way took us half a year at least. Wow. To be able to. Go, well, it was worth it though, go, right? To be able to go. I mean, it was necessary. Yeah. And then uh, uh, we went, and the, the, the engine and everything was good on it, but the springs went. One. The and the. We, in order to have more room, we took the cushions, front and back cushions out, and we had those stacked with canned goods, a lot of pork and beans, <laughs> uh, all kinds of that. And uh, uh, my doctor uh, gave us a box of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. uh, because he says you're going to need that up there because of those sun. And uh, we uh, we bought the Arctic sleeping bags. We rolled those up, and that's what we sat on. Oh, because you had the cushions out. Yeah, yeah we had the cushions out. Our, our, we had four and a dog. How did you uh, get hooked up with uh, RCA after the oh, war? With RCA Victor. RCA yeah. Victor, yes. <laughs> uh, after spending a, a, a year in the 
Fairbanks. And while there, we didn't just uh, stay rooted in any one place. Uh, uh, I don't know if you knew, but uh, there was a place you could go any time of the year and, and uh, take a bath and swim. Uh, they had these hot pools about, oh, I'd say it was about uh, a 30 minute drive <coughs> over, yeah, no road or anything, just over ground, frozen ground, uh, to this hot springs. Oh. Uh, you'd, you'd go uh, east and north, uh, northeast. And it was in that area where they had at that time the University of Alaska. And uh, so we'd go there once in a while and bathe and swim. Uh, going up to Circle City, Ar Arctic Circle. <clears throat> uh, I've panned for gold, and that's a lot of gold. <laughs> uh, you want me to move? And uh, there's always these old timers that wanted to get us to be their mule, I think. Uh, they just need, uh, they know where it's at. They know where it's where we can hit it rich. We can go up in the mountains looking for gold. Uh, no, thanks. No, <laughs> don't need that. Uh, I, uh, I skated the Cheetah River uh, in winter. My folks uh, went to uh, Alfred Johnson Ice Skate Company. Uh, I forget what the address here in Chicago. And if you bought a pair of skates there, they would send it to any place in the United States. And that would well. And, uh, Alaska was a, yeah. so they a territory to, then, not a state. So they sent mailed it all the way to Alaska for the Fairbanks. I picked it up at the post office. Wow. It didn't cost my folks a cent. That's great. Except for the skates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I used skate, and uh, th that was good because uh, you could skate with the rifle, uh, and uh, you had any, any animals, they would come to the shore. Yeah. Uh, we had the, the there was a uh, the silver dollar, which was on the first street, and the streets went one, two, three, four from the river, from the Cheetah River, out, and the first street was called the uh, first street, <clears throat> and it was called the silver dollar because. The entire floor was silver dollars. Uh, they were welded onto a nail, a large head nail, and then pounded into the floor. Oh. That way you couldn't pull them out or yeah. anything and you, you walked no, out. No with souvenirs them. with those silver dollars. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you saw very little paper money. Uh, twenties, twenties and tens, yeah, but no no paper dollars, because it, it would rot. It would uh, get uh, bad. Uh, anything had it was very wet mm. up there, oh. very humid, yeah. and so silver coins was it. Uh, anything you wanted to buy was a dollar. Two dollars, three dollars, no, none of this ninety-five cent stuff. Um, and uh, the only place we could find to stay, there's no hotel, motel, or anything there, is uh, the airport, uh, the airfield. <coughs> it was an army field. Yeah. Lad Field at that time. I don't know what it is today. Yeah. And they had one runway. Mm -hmm. And that runway was yet from uh, in the barracks 
back from World War II when all the Russians uh, pilots, they would fly the pilots over here to pick up their planes and fly them back to Russia. Oh, for, for their Air Force, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, any of the writing on the walls uh, or that was all uh, in Russian. <clears throat> they did have, and I don't remember how they got a hold of it, they had a radar at 543, I think, or something like that. Uh, radar set all the boxes in one of the barracks. And it was padlocked, there was lots of that. They showed it to me, wanted me to join up. They said, Do you know anything about it? I said, I could put that together with my eyes closed. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and they tried to get me to, because uh, I was, uh, uh, what, what do you call that, uh, uh, I, I was, uh, well, I, I, I didn't have the right uh, thing to work on it. I have to belong oh, to so the certificate or uh, yeah. I had card I had, to, I had to actually be in the service. Yes. Oh, okay. So if they could get me to join the service, no matter mm. what kind, <clears throat> I could I could work on that and together. But otherwise, no. Get no. me help. No. Yeah. I did run across one thing that was interesting on that base, and that is. They had some scientists there that were working on how the uh, how the uh, cold weather acts on people. What kind of food is better? One thing they learned: the worst thing in the world to put on is rubber galoshes on your feet. That's the worst because they cause your feet to sweat, and then the next thing is they freeze. Oh. And, uh, you know, so you're better off not to wear glasses, uh, better off not to get your feet wet. And you <laughs> wore wool. You wore wool on everything. Yeah. Uh, but, wool. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the way they did this, oh, they, they learned also from the Eskimos that it was better to have the fur on the outside and on the inside. So, through many years of uh, research, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, they they had the uh, uh, army guys there. Uh, uh, I guess they were just new in the service. And they had them sleeping outside in little pup tents in the cold weather. And they were examining their brain waves. <laughs> That's what I thought too. <laughs> they were examining their brain waves and they had a, a, um, a show of, of everyone's air, because everyone had different uh, Brain waves. They had a, like a football helmet <laughs> with peanut tubes. There was five peanut tubes at that time that was new. They were just coming in. They were embedded in that, and I don't know what kind of circuitry because I was never privy to check the it, so I could have told you immediately. Yeah. But they had a shack about a, a about a 10 by 10 shack with walls about this thick and they were leaded leaded and sawdust in there to be in a quiet room hmm. so hmm. there was nothing so there was no outside radio yeah. waves Oh, getting in. You get clear, clear signals. Yeah, yeah, because that would 
goofed them up there. And uh, every one of the men had a uh, uh, card on them in their file, and they would see what diets they were on, and they would uh, uh, check their air, uh, their brain waves, and tell you just how they were reacting to different uh, foods, yeah. different uh, and uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah, um, they could see when you were starting to get drowsy, what your particular brainwave was doing. They could tell uh, when you were completely out. Uh, and we had a couple of planes, uh, which I had a little bit to do with. And they, they didn't, the only thing they gave me to do was to uh, electrify some of the barracks, <laughs> put <laughs> lights in, this and that. But <clears throat> they had a, a, several of the planes where the brain waves would be set up to the automatic pilot. And if you went too high in the lack of oxygen, it would show it on there. And if it would go beyond the point that you did something, it had a red light on the instrument panel, uh, plus a, a, a audible alarm. Audible in those planes was dumb. Um, and if, if you were still coherent, you, you could take steps to need more oxygen or, or to get down lower or, or something. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't, it would automatically turn on the automatic pilot. Wow. And they didn't trust me with that. <laughs> <coughs> Not a I, I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't care because uh, I, 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 like I said, I, I, I was putting a hundred dollars a week away. Oh. With what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah two of the brothers, uh, they couldn't do anything, so they gave them a brush and made painters out of them. Oh. They wanted all them barracks painted. And one guy, uh, <coughs> Mike uh he uh, he was kind of a lightweight guy, he couldn't do much physical, uh, but he could type. Oh, they grabbed him into the oh, hangar yeah. and uh, typing up forms, yeah. and he liked it. Yeah. Uh, we were there during the time they had a real bad earthquake. Oh. And all the equipment in the shelves ended up in the, on the floor between the shelves. I'll bet. And we all spent time, one guy with a catalog, and then, what is this? Uh, what's oh, it was the all, of, it's all What's the number on this? Uh, it's organized, yeah. Uh, that's a 503-2188-X. Okay. <laughs> Put it back on the right shelf. Yeah. <laughs> Get this. We had half the stuff back in the shelves. The aftershock came. Oh, oh no. All your work was all oh. oh, gosh. So we had to get a carpenter, and he nailed things across the oh, front. Little little uh, ledges, right? Or so that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, just, just like a board ship, where they have those retainers for when when the ship is rolling. One of the things that uh, <clears throat> I was, have a problem with, and that is, I had 100% Prestone in my 33 Plymouth engine. And we had some cold nights there, and it froze. Oh. It froze. Was that cold? Yes. Oh. But it didn't affect my uh, radiator. Perfectly. No, no effect on the radiator. It, it cracked the block. Oh. It cracked the block about this long, 
and came out to about a quarter inch. It opened up. Yeah. Oh that? God, now what, what am I gonna do? Uh, it's the only means of transportation. Right. <laughs> um, so I got some steel wool, bought some steel wool in, in town, and uh, a hammer and a screwdriver. And I kept tapping and tapping the steel wool into the crack. crack. I had to replace the hose next, the hoses, they cracked. Hmm. They're rubber. They cracked. Hmm. The radiator didn't. Yeah. There wasn't enough water in those little spaces for cooling to expand enough to, cr to crack it. Fracture it, yeah. <clears throat> uh, then I remember what my father used to do as a janitor when in the boiler, uh, the tank cracked, he had to finish the winter before he could have that repaired. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Get some oatmeal. And I got the car running and got the water just pressed on good and hot and dumped this oatmeal in there little by little and there until we got as much oatmeal and that oatmeal would keep coming up around the, where I put the steel wool and it formed like a mushroom on there. They plugged it? Plugged it. I drove home with the damn car. All the way. Wow. I drove home with the damn with car. With that repair job? Yeah. <laughs> Never did leak after, after that. Wow. Um, so let's, uh, of course, I, I, I told you, uh, we went through, we went through uh, four axles, uh, we left with four spare axles for the rear, and we broke them in short order. Uh, what it was is uh, you found some sp uh, spot on the granite where the uh, wheel would spin, and you'd get to solid granite, it would stop like that, and oh. bing, you could hear it. Oh, not another axle. Wow. So there, the, the big thing is retrieving that part that's in the uh, uh, rear end, in the, in the differential. Uh, on a long stick, a uh, fishing line, because we had a lot of fishing line, <laughs> build, a, build a loop and put the flashlight shine in there and work that on there, get that loop on there and tighten it up and withdraw the piece of axle out of there and then put the new axle in and put the, everything back together again and away you go. So when we got the white horse, we uh, uh, telegraphed Bell Park old auto which was right across the street from Bell Park Olds. And uh, he sent us out a couple more axles. All total, I used six axles on that trip. My gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, good supply lines then, huh? <laughs> well, we got it back. Uh, what, uh, the guy that you type, he couldn't hack it anymore. Uh, when I, uh, we came in after work and on the bunks uh, he had a letter left and uh, sorry guys I, I just couldn't stay in it. and he uh, got a plane that was leaving for Seattle and he got on that and left. Never <laughs> heard from him again. Oh. Uh, the two brothers uh, we got into an argument there, roughly over playing cards every night, uh, and I was winning. And uh, uh, another thing was that before we left, we had agreed that whatever we made, we put into a pot, and each one took what he needs, mm -hmm. and whatever is left in there is be divided equally. Well, that didn't work out good because one of the guys, one of the brothers, 
Of course, that's all that was left. It was me and the two brothers. Two brothers. Yeah. Um, he uh, had to go into the town all the time, and he'd go on the Fourth Street. Uh, that that's the one that the, the old mud streets, but the sidewalks were all planks, wooden planks, and the only place in the world I think where you see uh, log cabins with picture windows. And when you get on that sidewalk, you could hear uh, all the way down the street, someone walking down there, and you'd see the drapes open up. So anyhow, this guy, practically every night he was going in there and spending five, ten dollars to throw, depending on what the Kluches uh, charged him. Uh, and then, you know what I mean, he, he was going for, uh, <laughs> how can I word this, uh, you know, <laughs> well, he was getting these uh, Eskimo women. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and that wasn't working so good. And then he always went with a six pack. And uh, he'd drink that one, two, three. And I started putting the cans into a pyramid until it reached the top in our hut. Because we had a Quonset hut. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, and it used to get cold in there, so cold that my uh, blanket would freeze to the inside of the <laughs> metal that metal wall. Of course, it was just a piece of metal between us and whatever it was outside. Yeah, and it was cold because we'd step out with a glass of water, shove it up in the air, and it came down ice, ice crystals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not crystals, actually ice. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so we couldn't get together on that. So I said, I believe him. Mm -hmm. So I made you know, one arrangements. I sold my guns in town. I had some money for that. And uh, I kept one, uh, I had a Lefevre double barrel shotgun. That was my protection and uh, drove home by myself. And uh, the worst part was uh, when I'd stop to pour fuel, because I had the side uh, jerry cans, five, five pound, five gallons Gallon. on each one. Yeah. <clears throat> Whenever I stopped for gas. And then I would, the best was I would stop on a bridge, and there's uh, I believe when my stomach is growling like this. Uh, I'd stop on the bridge, and I had a spotlight that was mounted in the center above the windshield, of the roof, and I had uh, a oatmeal box taped around the lens so that it wouldn't be shining off the hood too much in there. And I could direct that, I could direct that to the back and my headlights to the front on the bridge so I could see when I'm pouring gas, I could see to the front and I could see to the back and I had my shotgun uh, in there. Because another thing you had to worry about over there, there was wolverines. The wolverine was uh, not a wild animal. As a matter of fact, he didn't worry about bears. Uh, bears would only attack, and not in the winter. They were hibernating someplace. Yeah. But wolverines will attack even when they're not hungry. It's just their disposition. Their, it's their nature, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they've got to be killing something. Hmm. Uh, so that's how I would stop. And when I would go to sleep, I would try to sleep in the car. If I had to sleep on the outside, I would sleep with a shotgun in my in my uh, uh, sleeping bag. <clears throat> um, and uh, made it all the way home. Well, that's good. And uh, <clears throat> I answered an ad for RCA. RCA. That uh, I thought, well, television, it'd be good to 
No, I, I don't think I'd have too much trouble with that. No, not with your background. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I answered the ad and I put it on it. I just returned from Alaska. Cold weather doesn't bother <laughs> me. Uh, that. And so they called up and asked if uh, I'm putting up antennas. No. This is, is this back in Chicago now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> um, yes, uh, I, I wouldn't mind at all. So you, you started, so, started a long career with RCA then? So I was the seventh man hired in Chicago. Oh, okay. Ground floor. Yeah. <laughs> um, went to work, and at that time, uh, television sets were delivered in three boxes. The cabinet was in one box, the chassis was in another box, and the picture tube was in the third box. Yeah. And you had to assemble it in the customer's home. Yeah, you, had to, you yeah. couldn't assemble it and take it in, you had to do it right there. Yeah. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so that was good. And putting up the antenna was, was nothing. Uh, <laughs> geez, it was a wooden cross arm with holes already drilled for spacings. You put these rods on and put a couple of screws and you had the spin tight to tighten it. And then you had a U-bolt in the center, put it on a mast. And you, uh, if it's in apartment buildings or even some houses, they all got what we call a stink pipe, the, the vent from the bathroom. Yep. Uh, and so uh, you drill two holes on that and you put a clamp on there, yep. put the pipe in, a little pipe in there, and you got an antenna. Uh -huh. uh, what we did was we were kind to the uh, to the uh, firemen, is that we put it at least six feet high so that they wouldn't poke their eyes out. Oh, I've never uh, if they fired. Fired to run in the dark or running around. Up on a roof there. or something. Yeah, yeah. like. Some of the outfits, they, they put their antennas in the old way. Oh. Uh, so how many years did, were you with RCA? I was, uh, well, they soon, they soon uh, saw that I could do some of the TV work, so they put me on TVs mm. and put someone else on the antennas. Yeah. And I got to tell you this. Uh, before I went in with RCA, I got a job, uh, some uh, some uh, stoker outfit that uh, would uh, put stokers in your, so that uh, they would push the, you never had to shovel the coal into the boiler again. No. Uh, some of the people had new boilers put in, some the old boiler and the stoker uh, brought the coal in from underneath, some brought it up to it, and you just shoveled the coal from there in. And I went with that to help the guys where they had to break up the boiler mm -hmm. and carry in the new one, take the old one out. I carried the uh, wiring for the thermostat to control the, uh, the boiler and to control the uh, the uh, what we were putting in the stoker because mm -hmm. that was electrical, so anything electrical was my job. And this one uh, nice home, real nice home. Uh, it was west of uh, Cicero Avenue a little ways and a little bit uh, north of Belmont Avenue. And I remember it was, it was a very good looking girl there and she stayed home from work because someone had to be home, her parents both worked, and someone had to be home to uh, let the stoker people in to, to do the job. And there I am working with these guys, dirty as hell, just like we all were, and it was finished. and. Uh, she signed that someone, one of the other guys was the boss on there. And uh, he, uh, 
he got paid for a little check, I guess, and his parents left it. And I guess everything was okay because uh, I, I don't know of anyone having to go back there. But it was about, it was about a month later, about a month later, that I got a call to that address for television. Okay. Drive up there. It had a television truck with RCA mixer on. I ring the doorbell. The same girl comes to the door. How do you do, <laughs> RCA Victor? We're here to install your uh, TV set. <laughs> the look at her. <laughs> I just got through with her, stoker. Yeah. <laughs> so she. Let, let me in uh -huh. and was watching closely. I took the three boxes apart and everything and put that thing together, one, two, three. Yep. I got it working like great. I think it, there was no antenna, it was on rabbit ears. Oh, it was and in the house. That, that was a rabbit ear job. Oh, not on the roof. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, she just couldn't believe <laughs> that. Uh, the same man that this was the stokers and the boilers and yeah. <laughs> so, so, so after you you worked for RCA and retired, what what have you been doing? Well, uh, I became a union steward. Oh, because they were trying to really any any large company will <coughs> eventually try to take advantage mm -hmm. because that's how their men. Progress to get up, the more advantage they can take, either, the higher they go, I guess. And one of the worst things we had was we had a national contract. Oh. Therefore, the same money that we would negotiate for and get, the guys down in Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, yeah. they, they, some of them, they all had uh, maids, some of them had a butler. Uh, it, it was ridiculous. Wow. Uh, well, anyway, I had a bad job trying to save some of the guys that shouldn't be saved. Mm. I got in with the management that, listen, you hired this man. You've got 90 days in which to make up your mind whether he's going to work out or not. And when it's coming to the 90 days, I come in the office and I tell him, you know, Rich over there, he's going to be 90 days for celebrating pretty soon. Uh, some of the men really don't feel that he's up to it. That maybe landscaping, there's <laughs> no reflection on landscapers. Yeah. Uh, because uh, it takes no amount of plants up to do. But anyhow, he wouldn't work out in this field. And if he doesn't work out, he's bad for all of us. Mm -hmm. Some of them took the, the hint, some of them didn't. And then forever I'm saving this guy from all kinds of problems. Sure. That he's not putting out, he's not producing enough. Uh, we give him eight calls, he comes back with four non-contacts and stuff like that. Well, you had your chance to yeah. teach him. And so uh, RCA, uh, formed a a school, a uh, electronic television school. One that was uh, located in Rolling Meadow, mm -hmm. and one in uh, California. Uh, I think uh, Mississippi or so was kind of a dividing line, mm -hmm. uh, depending which site you lived. You came for training because they had the RCA shops all over the country. Right. And uh, they thought what they'd do is uh, make me an instructor. Oh. They did a lot of government work, so they felt that RCA should hire them. Oh, the government should, sure. yeah. And rightly so, because uh, RCA had a lot of places they could use them. Mm -hmm. But putting them into 
uh, people's expensive people's homes, uh, North Shore, they had with expensive pictures on the wall, with uh, uh, expensive everything in there, and a lot of times you're in there. They just uh, tell you to go in, uh, fix it, and I've even had when they left a check on the top of the set and you fill it in. <laughs> yeah. Not in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and take, take for example, like like uh, downtown, uh, those buildings uh, with the, these people that have uh, three and four homes in the country, sometimes they're not at one place for a year. Mm -hmm. Yet they got a maid and a butler there, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of the place. Uh, so I'm fixing it for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so RCA has to be real careful who they hire. Oh, I see, yeah. For confidentiality yeah. and integrity. Yeah. Well, one day they had to, and so they called up, they're going to have a photographer come down to take pictures of RCA training these people. Mm -hmm. Okay, well these guys came to work, came to school summertime on their motorcycles with short sleeves, uh, skull and crossbones, tattoos, and stuff. The, yeah. tattoos, yeah. everything. All right. So I had them take pictures of them, showing them adjusting with a diddle stick, adjusting the picture, and this and that, and a deal done in front of it, you know, big arms. Uh, uh, <laughs> when New Jersey got a hold of the, these pictures and that, they nearly crapped. Oops, oops, pardon me. Uh, so anyway, uh, it didn't work out too well because, you know, everybody has a boss and I had a boss. Right. I had a boss, his name was Gil Munch. Gil Munch. Yeah. And uh, he was a good technician. He knew his stuff. But he was girl crazy. <laughs> any, 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 uh, any uh, secretary that we'd get, You'd have to go on after her, you see. And one day, I'm giving a lecture on the stage and I needed something out of my locker in the, uh, one of the rooms. And I had these crepe soles on and it was just a minute and I ran out and I get in there and there's this guy having sex with the secretary. Well, that was the end of me. Oh, that was that was the end of me. You could find he everything. wasn't caught. You were caught. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, he could find everything in the world wrong with my work. Mm -hmm. everything. But I thought, well, that's okay. I'm really not making that much money. Uh, the, the hospitalization was beautiful. Uh, the uh, Vacations were beautiful, uh, everything, and the, I liked the work. That was beautiful. <clears throat> but one of my buddies uh, working at the uh, Board of Education, he was an electrician, mm -hmm. and his boss needed somebody in electronics to take care of their, uh, uh, to take care of their uh, foreign language labs. Oh yeah. Hey, I'm just a man for you. Fine. Uh, I uh, dressed up. Uh, I looked like Chamberlain. I had one of old uh, uh, umbrellas, you know, I, I acted as a cane mm -hmm. uh, there and. 
but the only thing I didn't have was a high hat. And uh, they hired me immediately. Okay, I went to work. I didn't lose a day. Oh, great. And uh, work, works in the, the, the language labs. And I had those going, working good, about a, two years. Now, uh, that's when the, RC, when the Board of Education decided <clears throat> they were going to cut down on uh, workers in, in the, the school buildings and uh, by putting all the heating units controlled from the things on the roof. And uh, they had a lot of heating units on the roof. That's not a place for a heating unit, let me tell you. <laughs> <clears throat> and they would control it from downtown. Well, we did one building. It was somewhat okay. You had two buildings. Now, it would have been okay if we had the right person from the central office that's controlling this. But he was a ham radio man and he pictured himself as know-it-all. We got six schools online going automatically. Mm -hmm. There's so many errors made on there. Like for example, the big high school downtown I think it has something like 48 heating units on the roof. And where we had set up where heating units in the morning you press this button, they would come up one at a time, one after another, given a reasonable time. Because you see the school board is charged for their power by peak current. If they have a, they keep the average current down, then it's cheaper. This guy devised something that was going to take care of it, something or other. The engineer came in in the morning, he pressed the button and he said, it felt like the building changed the address. <laughs> All 48 units came on at once. <laughs> you can imagine what the drain was on that. Oh, oh yes. my God. Well, and yeah. so, little by little, they saw that that wasn't going to work out. It would work out on brand new schools that they built. Oh, but not the old. Uh, no, when it's incorporated into the school. But not taking an old school and making it <laughs> good. So now what are they going to do with me? Uh, the language labs are all working. They don't need anyone. Uh, the, the heating, cooling is <coughs> going to go back to like it was. Security. They were breaking in left and right all over. <laughs> no, they put me in security. Huh? Put, <coughs> put in the um, security all over everything and where did they come in from? Well, I'd go around and look, let's see, they broke in his window in here. This is first floor, ground level. Uh, brick in the window. <laughs> brick it in, okay. <laughs> That's why if you go through Chicago and right, get these old schools, you'll see that you see you'll see the new brick <laughs> in uh, all bricked in. Yeah. Some of them, even second floor, in certain areas, they had bars on the windows. They would come with a hook. They would throw a grappling hook up there, get a hold of it, tie it to the back of the truck, boom, take a half the damn wall with it. And there. Wow. And there, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> uh, 
the doorways. They go in through doorways. Uh, they put Lexon glass instead of glass and Lexon all over. These kids learned that you take a take a, a can of hairspray or something that acts as a torch, light it, put it on there, melt a hole in that, in that just like, the, the, like that, you just down in there and open up. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. So I, I worked on the, the security the board of Ed for a long time. Uh -huh. And uh, I liked that too. Only the bullets were starting to come too close to me. The bullets? Bullets. <laughs> uh, this one school, uh, this one school that was uh, just the other side of Phillips High School. Uh, I, I was finishing up a job in there with the, and I was talking to the engineer and the engineer looks at us, well, it's getting time, let's, let's get out of here. So we're walking to our cars and uh, I'm going to unlock the alarm on my front fender and I smelled, I, I, I knew gunpowder. I smelled the gunpowder, went past my face, hit the engineer in the elbow. He gets in his car, starts it, takes off. I open the door and I dove in, start it, and get out of there. Did, did I get hit and don't feel it? Or it feels wet. Uh oh. It feels what so I got it uh, on the, oh, Roosevelt Road. Yeah, I stopped and pulled up on Roosevelt Road. There was a lot of traffic there. And uh, I look in there. In diving in, I hit the thing on the car door on the door jam, and I put a gash in my side. Oh. <laughs> it's better than a bullet. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, and this kind of thing was going on. Some of the schools then they start throwing bottles and rocks oh. and at me as I'm driving. Me, Get out of here, hunky! Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, some of the schools further south, I'd get in there, working, the engineer looking at me. Don't you have a partner? Don't you have a black man with you? I says, no, no, sir. Uh, well, you, you should you should have. Well, we'll see you there. Uh, this type of thing. And uh, I figured it's time to retire. I counted my shekels and I told Marcy, I says, I'm retiring. And so she retired at the same time. Oh, okay. I, I left the place, stopped on the way, got a Dozen of roses. She was working at Lucky Wards, yeah. uh, Randhurst, and I stopped in there. And she's not at the register where she usually is. So I asked the girls, uh, "Where's Marcy? She's in the office." Okay, so I went in, opened up, went in, and uh, there's she's working. I said, "We're leaving," <laughs> and she looks at the clock. And it's, what are you going to do, fire you? <laughs> uh, and that's the way I was uh, all my life. <laughs> uh, and the boss, her boss, uh, looking at, he, he wasn't happy about you leaving. Um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to your military history? Well, I, I never knew how close I was to danger. One of the things everybody, when I go to the school to some of the kids, they ask, well, how many did you shoot? I didn't shoot any. The only thing I killed, the only thing I killed, and that was the, when we were flying over the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, that is, <laughs> and uh, there, there was a lot of, 
uh, porpoises in those days. A lot of porpoises. I don't know where they all went. I only shot one. And uh, the pilot says, hey, Terry, uh, how good are you? So I took it with a 50 caliber yeah, in there and burp. This is like that. Uh, and I felt bad about it. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, after. Yeah. <clears throat> However, I must have taught, I must have taught uh, 15 pilots how to uh, uh, locate an enemy plane yeah. and how to uh, approach it and how to down it. I must have uh, taught same number and then how to recognize a foreign ship. Yeah. And, and how, to, how to approach it and drop the torpedo yeah. and get the hell out of there. Yeah. And I'm sure that out of those men, at least one was successful. I'm sure. Okay, John. On behalf of the Yankee Air Museum, I'd like to thank you for letting me come into your home and conduct this interview. It's been a distinct privilege. A really rewarding experience to listen to your story. Thank you very much. Thank you.